Yeah, so I remember it was uh, is at the Bears Den Fly Show. They used to have this show every winter, and Andy Mill was the special guest there who's like a legendary tarpon angler, wrote a book, like real good guy. He did this demo where he showed people like how much pressure you're actually putting on a fish with a bent rod versus a straight rod. And it like was mind blowing to people. Basically, it's probably close to half. And when we did it here, like you just we, we hung the line over something smooth with like a twenty pound weight, and bend the rod, and you just try to crank on it, and the weight doesn't even move. <laughs> yeah. Point the rod straight at it, reel down and pull straight back. The thing looks right off the ground. It, yeah. So he was explaining to people like how you need to fight tarpon to beat them. Same thing, kind of with tuna. Like you gotta mentally whoop their ass so they're you break their spirit. It's it's. You know what I'm saying? People think that it's a some some of the biggest guys on my boat think they can muscle these fish, and those are guys who actually crumble the first. Yeah. The bigger the guy, because tuna aren't about strength; they're about stamina. And some of the smallest guys on my boat that have superior technique, they're the ones that can land the fish the quickest, because it's not about muscling the fish. Yeah. It's not a sprint. It's, it's more of a, no, uh, it's, it's, more, not. it's more of a marathon. Yeah, yeah. With the fish. Makes yeah, sense. and we like I realized realized that in the fight. Like the first big fish we hooked that day, like he whooped it for like a good five six minutes. Like cranked on. He's like, "You ready to switch?" I'm like, "Oh, okay." Not because you were giving up. It's like when you put that much heat on a fish for like five ten straight minutes. Dude, it's exhausting. Yeah. Like, I lasted a minute. I'm like, you ready? And he's like, I just gave you the rod back. I'm like, dude, I'm done. <laughs> it's not about, I, I always, I try to explain to clients, people get this, they have this pride thing going on that they want to land the fish, they want to land the fish. Tuna are um, a very unique species in the fact that they're warm-blooded and um, they won't get tired like a like a, like an average fish that we fight will. So I, I always talk about tuna fishing, especially with the light tackle game, as if it's um, it's a group effort. You or you or you, it's not your fish, it's our fish. We sure. did it together. Yeah. Green arms, there's no pride involved in it. There shouldn't be any pride involved in it. The minute you're tired and you can't put maximum pressure on that fish, pass the rod off to somebody who can. Shake it off, you know, get your energy back, and do it again. You know, um, and people see that, that we can get stuff done quicker. We can get this fish to the boat. We can unhook it. We can release it or we can gaff it and put it in the boat. Yeah, move on and, to the next one. Exactly. Or else we're going to sit here for eight hours and right. fight the same stupid and can, fish. And we can get back to catching more. And that's something I love to do is I want quantity when I'm chasing fish on top water. I don't care about fighting one fish for four hours. It doesn't yeah, do anything for yeah. me. I want to catch a lot of them. Right. I want the, I want to experience it a lot throughout the day. It's interesting for sure. Like I don't. It's probably because people, there's not many types of fish that are like that. No, where it's a group not. effort. You know, no. it's usually just like soloing. It's one of the you, only ones. You take pride in like that fish that you land yourself. So I feel like people come in with that attitude. They do. Like, they do. But most of the people who come in with that attitude have never done it before. Yeah. Yeah. So they they have. But I'm sure after their first time, they're yeah. like a little more relaxed. And, Next and, time they're and, like, and like Brooks, I get especially it. Especially after they get smoked. Brooks knows you know? too. I said a lot of people. A lot of people want to go catch giants on, on light tackle stuff because they've never caught giants on light tackle, light tackle stuff. Yeah. But once you do it once, you realize it's it's not that fun. No. It's about the feed. It's about the eat. And then after about 10 minutes yeah. in, you're like, I, I regret this decision yeah, completely. So, yeah, yeah. So this year, we, we had an incredible year catching giants on the jig. And what I did is a month into the season when we were catching, we were hooking like five or 10 a day. I switched out my jigs to a much lighter gauge hook. A hook that could still land a 50, 60 inch fish, but I know I could straighten the hook out at any time throughout the fight on a giant. Yeah. And I was doing that because I didn't want to fight a fish for five hours, possibly kill the fish when we couldn't keep it. Sure. So we'd fight it the initial run, we'd realize how big it was. I'd cup the spool, I'd lock it down, and I'd just pull slowly, steadily, and Pop, it would pop off. I'd reel in the hook. The hook was straightened out. Yeah. We'd no, bend it back. On to the next fish. Move on. Yeah. yeah. Sounds exactly. very reasonable. Don't yeah. have to break off any hardware in right. your mouth. Or we don't we don't sacrifice the fish. Jewelry. We're not yeah. hurting the fish. Yeah. The fish is, you know, back to doing what he's doing. No. And For sure. On we go. He close enough to the mic, Matt. Good? It sounds pretty good. All right. Honestly. Perfect. Yeah. Am I um, surprised how yeah, I, I mean, was picking it up? Maybe audience but besides that, okay. we'll we'll get into all that, like commercial days non-commercial days giants what you do you know what i mean so anyways welcome to the program everyone this is Cortland hooked the podcast
I'm here with my co-host, Mr. Matt Barovi. I'm your host, Brooks Robinson, and special guest in studio, Mr. Matt Paracchio. Is that how you spell it? Yes, I, I Matt Paracchio. That. Paracchio yeah. of Titan Up Charters. Uh, welcome to the program, boys. Thanks for joining us today. Um, Matt, you are from Connecticut. Correct. But you're here in New York. What mm. the hell are you doing here right now? Um, Besides there. the podcast. <laughs> we have a house up on the Salmon River. And um, this is probably twenty year 24, 25 that we've been going up here for yeah. Steelhead. And it's a nice break from um, from chartering when I can just fish I'm sure. on my own. Are you done with chartering for the year? Is you, you haven't winterized your boat yet. I haven't winterized the boat yet. I still have guys that want to go. There's a chance you might get back out yeah. there. Like I'm going to go back to Connecticut today. And um, there's a possibility I might get back out to the Cape next do week. You, do you get tired of the the game or do you just get burnt out from so many days for so long it's, that it's like like i know you love it no matter what like when we went fishing together like you're like dude my knees are shaking and that's when i knew you really loved it when you do it for that many years that many days in a row and you still get just ramped up when you see fish on the surface like i know you really like it I, yeah i love it i don't get tired of it i get tired i, I lose the drive of the, to it's get the grind. started to do sure. it that day. Once you're out but there. But once I'm out there, yeah. and I see those birds off in the distance, and I see the fish starting to crash, like I was telling you, my knees still knock together like it's my first time doing For it. For sure. Because I'm so excited to get to that spot. For sure. But I'm not jumping out of bed with my alarm clock like I do in June or July, yeah. in the initial hunt of yep. the season. Now it's just, you know, it's like a steelhead fisherman come April. Yeah. We're like, yeah. You're over it. Yeah, we're over it. Yeah. You know? Let's move on to something else. I still love it. Yeah. You know, I, agree. I just don't have the, the off season's nice, though. You know, I get to spend a lot more time with the family. Get to and recharge. I'm going to recharge. You do know, your, do over, your gear. Yep. Look over all the gear um, and look forward to, to you know, new times, new changes and new additions to the, the chartering, the Fleet, chartering outfit yeah, next year. For sure. You know? um, I mean, basically what we're going to cover today, for those of you that are listening, is the northern atlantic bluefin tuna mm -hmm. is that yeah right there's yeah. there's a couple different bodies of fish and we'll get to that um your chartering business the gear you use you know the fish that like the we're gonna basically go over kind of the ins and outs and try to hit on everything right like you said the other day when i said let's do a podcast you're like bro we could spend just two hours just talking about jigging yeah just two hours just talking about top water just two hours talking about commercial fish yeah. right so we're going to try to just give people that don't understand the fishery, don't know the fish, just a general overview, right? So maybe they're watching, um, what's that Nat Geo show? Uh, Wicked, Wicked Tuna, Tuna, right? That only shows you probably 5% of what's actually going on in the fishery. And we'll get to that. So I, yeah. I just, I yeah. want to give people that don't understand that fish and that fishery, like what it's all about. Um, I'm obsessed with it. I thought the first time that I caught a tarpon on a fly, I'm like, this is it. This is all I want to do. Right. And then that that show came out, and I'm like, this is freaking cool. And then I became the sales rep for Cortland in New England and started selling hollow core, started understanding the fish. I'm like, no, 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 no. This is what I want to do. And I'm absolutely obsessed with it. And so you and I went out, I don't know, what, three weeks ago now? Yeah, I think it was um, – I just looked at the pictures yesterday. I think it was October 11th. Something like 10th that. 10th and 11th, I think we went. And – I just, I've always, there's something about that fish. There's something about the New England coastline. And we've talked about this before. Mm -hmm. Like I've caught tuna before um, in New Jersey, offshore, jigging, trolling, top water. But there's something about like the bluefin in New England, in that coastline um, that I'm obsessed with. So I'm stoked about this podcast for one. Um, I'm stoked to have you here. And this is the first time you've been to Cortland. Correct. I mean, Cortland, New York, but to the plant. To so the plant, yeah, I've never been here. We it just was... toured the plant. I mean, yeah. what'd you think? Pretty incredible. I, I never knew how in-depth the process was to make the braid. It's pretty neat. It's pretty it? incredible. I, I, and I didn't think there was so many steps. And I can't believe... Right when I thought that the process would have been done, I, I, you bring me to another room and it's not. For sure. I mean, you love our C-16 holocore, which we'll get to. Yeah. Does seeing it made make you appreciate it a little bit more than what you did previously? Like you asked me before, you're like, dude, you're obsessed with tuna, but going out with me and actually getting one, 
did that just dump fuel on the fire? I'm like, no, yeah, see, it seeing it, seeing him hate doesn't, doesn't improve anything. It's just the, um, connection, everything like about said. the line. Yeah. That's all it needs. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, everything about the line is, is the reason I use it, you know, on all the rods. Um, seeing it made was just, it added to how cool the process is. I've never seen it. For like, sure. Puts I've never in been in a perspective. It's yeah. a unique you know, process. Right. I mean, everyone that comes here that does a plant tour, whether they're pro staff, ambassadors, friends, family, we have just random customers that stop by. <clears throat> everyone leaves here that's like, that was way more than I thought went into it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And yeah. for us that work here every day, it's like, it's just another day. You know what I mean? But it, right. if and you love fishing and you come here and you see that, you're like, wow. This but is... I've been in the industry my entire life. Sure. You know, I'm 46 years old and I've never seen other than, you know, small clips of videos up on online here and there, but I've never been and seen the way. The noise. The, the yeah, the yeah. The noise. The and, people. Yep. Right. And it's unique. It's unique. And it was nice. It was nice to see. It was just something, you know, to add to the mental Rolodex for sure. Yeah, so, it's like you see that spool and you don't really think about that stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. then you like, come oh. and see the whole show and then start you're like, to finish. Wow, you're like, what happens? Yeah, to put yeah. That makes you think about together. it more when you. Yeah, it's you pretty know, incredible when you see the finished product. So yeah, so we're talking about bluefin tuner today. We're talking about C16 today, um, specifically you chartering in Cape Cod. Mm -hmm. um, but let's kind of start with some history of you, where you're from, like where were you born, where were you raised. Born in uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut. Um, lived in Bridgeport um, first couple of years of my life. Parents moved to Monroe, Connecticut. Um, born and raised there. Went to high school there. Um, graduated from there. Moved out of there um, for three, four years. Um, and then we bought a house, moved back. And um, I just liked the town. Growing up, my parents had a place at Cape Cod. So we would go there the day after school ended. How long did they have that place? They, have they always had the three, house? That was three, one of my questions. Yeah, three or four years before I was born. Gotcha. You know, so I was born in 76. I think they bought it in early 70s. So I didn't know anything else um, other than summer at Cape Cod. You start, when do you start fishing? You just fish your whole life? Grow up yeah, fishing? Yeah, I fished my whole life. Yeah. I uh, my, my first 50 pound striped bass I got when I was nine, my second one 11, and I got my third one at 13. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. I assumed like when you would go to the Cape, you started fishing for striped bass, right? Yeah. They're, they're easier to target than a bluefin tuna. Right. We were, when you're young. We were slinging eels. Off the back beach. Um, back in the glory days of the striped bass yeah, at the Cape. Yeah. I mean, I have 26 50 pounders and. Um, Jesus. And they were all within like a 12 year period. Were you any know? of those from Long Island? Did you grow up fishing Long Island Sound at all? Or mostly Cape Cod? Mostly the Cape. The house? Okay. Mostly the Cape. It's getting back there, but it ain't what it used to it's be. It's not, no. I mean, it, it would be. You're talking years. Yeah. You know, first off, you'd have to get rid of all the, the seals and. Yeah. You know, you have to bring the bait back. There's a whole bunch of, there's a whole bunch of factors when, that would have to fall in When place. do you start tuna fishing on the Cape? Every year is like, different. Like and what, that's what's that's why it's hard how to old were, How old were you when you started? Oh, oh I um 12, like you're you're 12, striped bass fishing, right? And then does someone say, Hey Matt, jump on the boat and no, come tuna fishing? No, we I remember we used to back we used to fish off the back beaches for the stripers um when I was a teenager and even my early twenties. And we used to see what we always said, oh, that's the tuna fleet on the outside of us. Yep. It was all the big boats, the big down easters, drifting baits. So for, for it, people like geography wise, like you're just south of Provincetown on the Cape, south, right? Yeah, south about of four, Provincetown. Four or five miles or so. I mean, you could see it out your back door. Right. Yeah, the, the border of Provincetown is like a mile from our. So our you're talking about the bay side of Cape Cod? No, the ocean side. The ocean side. The ocean okay. side. So when I say the back side, the back side on the Cape is typically refer to the east side of the Cape. Gotcha. The ocean side. Yep. Yes. <clears throat> um, the bay side or the inside um, is really all we call that. You know, nobody says to the west. Gotcha. You know, they'll refer to specific parts of the bay as to the west. Sure. To the southern. Um, but when I say the back side, which is where I spend 90% of my time, that's all ocean side. So, so you're striper fishing. You're like, oh, there's the tuna fleet. Right? Yeah, and, and they were a mile or two outside. Of so, so time. when when what's your first experience tuna fishing growing up? I, I was probably about fifteen years ago. How old are you? I was. I it was probably in my early thirties. Okay. Um, did you jump on a boat, friend's boat, my boat? Did you get a charter? Oh, you got a boat, and you're like, let's. I want to. My try boat. this tuna yeah, thing. Yeah, because I I didn't have a a big boat, nice boat growing up. Right. I mean, I was. 
Most people don't. Running an aluminum, a 14-foot aluminum off the back beaches um, up until my late 20s. Yep. I never had. And then finally we bought a 21-foot um, cat, a sea cat. And I, and I thought it was the biggest boat in the world and at, at that time. Do you I, feel like your first outing that you were as prepared then as what you are today? Yeah. I mean, you've told me that. You're like, dude, the gear I was using was, when I first started was not up I to had, par. I had, it was very, very good for a striped bass fishery, <laughs> but I had no idea. For 50 pounders, too. Right. So, like, yeah. Right. I had no idea that a 30-pound tuna could do twice the damage of a 50-pound striper. And, I mean, it was a struggle in the beginning. Nobody helped me. Um, I never really got advice. I had to learn a lot of the stuff I did on my own from reading. And um, even back then, the Internet wasn't nearly as big as it is no. now. No, yeah, and correct. the amount of information yeah. that was there really wasn't there. Trial by error. Trial by error. And I just threw myself right into the fire. And I burned, you know. Um, I went... A season and a half without catching one. So that was what fifteen years ago. You said yeah. when do you start chartering and commercial fishing, both whatever, right for tuna? Like when do you start this business? Well, I wanted to charter, but I wasn't going to do it until I knew I was going to be um, the decent at it. Yeah, yeah. And, and able to target the fish right. appropriately. I mean, you're taking people. people's money at the end of the day. You right. want to be successful, right? So um, this is. I'm just trying to think of the boats. This is year two, uh, two, six, eight, nine years ago. Got it. Nine years ago, eight, nine years ago. I said, let me start chartering. And I enjoy teaching people and I enjoy showing people and I enjoy to see the excitement with them. Is What was the hardest thing about chartering when you first started? Was it finding the fish? Was it getting your gear dialed in? Was it dealing with different people, people. on a deal? People dealing with different because I'm not. I'm not. I was never concerned with finding fish or right? catching fish. That was not. I'm not. You know, bragging here, but I, that was never an issue with yep. me growing up, and I, that's never. You're a fishy. Of mine. You're I'm, a fishy dude. Yeah, and I'm learning each person. Yeah, the individual personalities that I meet on a daily basis, sure. adapting to a client. Or clients, in order to make the day pleasant yeah. for Dude, everybody. You're in close quarters with people you've never met before for yeah. eight, nine, for eight, ten, nine eleven hours, hours, and they're giving you money right. for a job that you haven't performed yet. Right. Um, so it, there's pressure, you know, for sure. And you know, striped bass charters, it's different. Bluefish fluke, they're all different. When you go on a tuna charter, um, it's difficult. It's difficult. Um, it's intense for one it's because intense the, for one. like the fish, you know, are on another level. They're on another level with strength. People speed. are like weather, right? When as a guide, you don't know who's showing up. It's like you can't control the weather. You can't control right. these clients. Right. You know what I mean? And like you said, you're in close quarters with these people for a long time. Like you got to find something in common. You have to coach them. They yeah. have to listen. They have to listen. You have to find a middle ground to have a successful day. Right. One of one of the one of the biggest difficulties I've had to figure out with with clients is, I it's easier if they tell me or they're honest with me, and maybe they don't know, but I ask them, "What experience do you guys have? You know, are you fishermen? Do you just like right?" And, and everybody, you know, says, "Yeah, we're fishermen," and I'm like, "Are you fishermen or do you like to fish?" Right. It's two different things. Sure. And most of the people that come on my boat, um, they tell me that they're fishermen. And I know pretty quick, within 30 seconds, if you pick picking up a rod. Or, a how, or how they step on a boat. Or they how to step on a boat or how they're dressed. Yep. Um, if they're a fisherman or not. And I'm not insulting anybody by sure. asking them this. I said, I can... I can t I, I can adjust my day and how I'm going to approach You want to know what fish. you're getting yourself into right. before you leave the dock. And I can change how I'm going to approach these fish and go after them for the day based on your skill level. Sure. And, you know, and this is why my the, my list of clients that I get on a yearly basis is a huge percentage of it is repeat clients. Yep. Because we've developed a relationship over the years. For sure. We know what each other's about. And that's why I love helping them. It's because next year it'll be better. And, and easier, easier on, yeah. For you, yep. for me, for everybody. What is the best part about, after all these years of chartering, what is the best part about chartering? Fortuna. Watching, that you watching somebody get more excited than they've ever been with a rod in their hand when they hook up to their first fish. 
knowing that they've tried to target these fish for a couple of years, they've never hooked one. They've watched it on TV. They've never been able to hook one. And us going out and doing it. When I get guys, you know, a dozen, two dozen times a year, guys are like, we've never done this. We want to do it. It's our bucket list. And when I can check off bucket list accomplishments sure. all year long for people, what's better than that? You did for me. Yeah. Like, it was a bucket list to do the New England bluefin game. It was a bucket list to see three, four, five hundred pounders crashing on the surface off the yeah. bow of the boat. Um, I There was things, and we, we chatted about this when we were driving back. I'm like, dude, there was probably ten things I wanted to experience in fishing today with this fish and this fishery. And I checked off every single yeah. one of them. Hooking a fish, getting a fish, seeing the sun come up on Cape Cod, leaving out of the harbor, going around the point, seeing tuna from three miles away, because it was slicked out when we went. Yeah, I mean, was, the weather was, was epic. Like, yeah. when you see a fish break surface three miles away... And you don't even see the splash. You see the entire fish. The whole fish. The water. Really? The it first, looks like a small The swagger. first time I <laughs> saw that, I'm like... This is going down today. Yeah. Like we're gonna stick yeah. something, and this is gonna be freaking and we're gonna, epic. And we're, and we're targeting one of the most difficult fish in the world to catch, in probably one of the most difficult ways to do it. Yeah, spin you gear. Know? Yeah, spin Not gear. Not live baiting and light spin gear. Dude. Yeah. So I mean, it was it was great, dude. Yeah. And, and I got lucky. Like I was out there for a sales trip on the Cape. Okay, he had a charter cancel. The weather was perfect, which in October, which you've told me before, you're like, October is one of the best months, but it's the hardest month in terms of weather. So just God was on my side and things aligned. It and, beautiful and, that day. and it happened. And I dude. lost two weeks after that. Before that, too. Yeah. I it remember was, it was it was two but, weeks before I say, I'm going to be at the Cape. If I, you know, maybe I can work around a schedule. If you get a cancellation, you're like, dude, the weather looks horrendous for the next 14 days. And, I, and he looked at it too, and he said, man, it does not look good. And then yeah. slowly it started getting better and better <laughs> and like, better. Let's pray. And then like three days before, I'm like, it looks slicked out. He go, yeah, it's on. It's game on. And I'm like, holy shit. And it was shit. greasy. It was one of the greasiest days. I mean, some of those clips up there, Matt, you can pull up one of those clips for us with those with the with the bait crashing <laughs> on the water. I mean, some of these fish that we pulled up to. Like, we're at a distance, you know what I mean? You'd get there. It was like, you called it whack-a-mole. Yeah. You'd see them, you drive over, you get one cast in, they were gone. Yeah. These fish that we finally found and then I filmed. So I filmed most of the day. Like, I've caught tuna before, but I wanted to get this footage for, for Cortland, sure. for you guys to see. And we roll and over. for us to see. Yeah, and for, for Matt. Matt's never seen half this stuff. <laughs> so we roll over to these fish. And they kind of go down for a minute, and we're kind of looking, we're kind of looking, and it's just slicked out. Yeah, that's the one. And all of a sudden, like, the bait just starts spraying out of the water real light, and all of a sudden, these fish just appear, like three or four of them. Yeah. And it was just like, I remember, like, turning the camera off once it was over. You can play that, Matt. And I was just, here we go. Oh, oh, right here, Matt. They're spraying. There's, oh my fucking god. Oh my god, those fish. <laughs> these these are massive. Massive. God, you hear Matt goes, "These are big fish." I'm like, "You think?" And the problem with those fish is our issue is they're actually too close to the boat. Yeah, you said that. You said the lure just doesn't work. What, yeah, you got to you, get it to work. The yeah. lure can't. Why is that? Because you don't have as much time to pick no, up there, speed yeah. on it. Or? There's nothing in between. Thanks, Matt, for you pulling and, that up. You and the lure. Yeah. You know what I mean? The lure lands 20 feet away from the yeah. boat, and so you, you can just twitch have, it twice. Yeah, yeah. So you just don't have enough time to work right. and really pick up speed. Yeah, they're actually, if those it, fish yeah. came up, now, we probably wouldn't have wanted to, to deal no, with those fish. we did not. We ended up um, doing it anyways on we accident. We ended up doing it anyway later on. So what Matt's yeah. talking about is these fish were massive, and you don't know what you're going to get out there. Sure. We're trying no, to don't. find, and we'll get to this. So uh commercial fish commercial fishing season it's got to be over 73 inches some days it's open some days it's not some days the quota's filled some days whatever right that day the commercial season was closed so anything over 73 inches we had to let go so we're trying to find smaller wreck size fish as sure. they call it under 73 inches well it was nothing but tanks out there we finally roll up to some fish maybe about a half an hour after this that like looked 50 60 inch range like mm -hmm. comfortable size fish for spin gear matt throws it in there and just immediately buttons up a fish that was not 50 or 60 inches, way freaking bigger. Had a zero to it. Yeah, and in like within five seconds, he's like, "Dude, this is not the one we want to be hooking." And it just he gets on the motor, and we start going over it. So I was—he was, was going to spool me. We were using some of the smaller reels, and he was actually going to spool me. 
It was and not I, good. Geez. And I had to that go. Was, that was the guy that helped you? That was that uh, one? Yeah, we oh, did. Okay. We uh, Matt called one of his buddies. He's like, yo, we need some help. Like what Matt was saying before, like it's a team effort. Yeah. And there was a guy that came from another boat that jumped on our boat to help us fight this fish. And I mean, even Matt, I think halfway through that fight, you're like, dude, you got to take the rod. My back just locked up. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's awkward. Like guys that have the technique, they can do it. But for those sure. people that have never held a rod that big with a spin reel that big yeah. and put that much heat on a fish, you're using muscles that you've never, I had muscles in my toes that locked up. I'm like, I didn't even, <laughs> like, it's just, it's so sure intense. Whole, you feel it what, your what, whole body. what happens is people, um, I watch them doing it all year long and I'm trying to coach them throughout the whole thing. And I say, guys, just calm down. They're holding the real handle super tight. They're yeah, white knuckled. Yeah. And I said, guys, come on, you're, you're using all these, these muscles you don't need to be using right now. And I said, you don't need to be squeezing that handle tight. I said, it's doing nothing for you. And I'd grab the rod real quick and I'd show him. And I go, look, you could just turn it with one finger. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Go, you make it look easy. Stop. Yeah. I go, well, stop. I know. It's, I, it's experience. Well, a lot, so of, I go, stop yeah. tensing a lot up. of people don't think in that moment. Right. They're just like, no, no they you just, don't. They're freaking out. They, you they're don't. freaking out. And that's the intensity of, of catching these fish. Yeah. You know? That's pretty crazy. Pull up uh, pull up Matt's Instagram. We'll just throw that up there. What When does your season start for tuna chartering on the Cape? Every year is different. Every the, year is this, different. This year was... It was like so, late June, right? Look at that first picture. Who's that guy? That's Big Brooks right there. There you go. That's the fish <laughs> there he from... Is. That's, that was, that's, that's like, the small one. That is my glory. I'm going to blow that How up and frame that? it in my bedroom. So that one was 54? Four, no. yeah. It barely kind of fit in the the chest of the, right. the boat. I yeah, think that you remember. One, th that was the small one. Yeah, so when, small one. when commercial seasons closed, mm -hmm. do you... Do you try to, I mean, so like you're not targeting, what's the to largest, I very, what's the largest I very that rare. you'll try to target on a spin rod? Oh, I'll target anything they want. Okay. Um, depending on, um, depending on how, their experience. Okay. So like there's a certain group of guys that comes with me every year. They come with me, you know, half a dozen times a year. That, those type of guys, I, I'll target, it's actually like Danny in the second picture on the bottom. In the middle, you put like, them on any fish. I'll put them on any fish. Right. Okay. I don't even bring a rod when those guys come. But when you get weak links okay. like me, you're like, we need to find something small today. The the average guy wants to fight a fish like the ones you see everybody holding. You know. Sure. Sure. Because those fish are yeah. are big enough to they beat to you hurt. up, but you can get it over with. Yeah. Right. And you can use a spin rod. Yeah. Well, you can use a spin rod yeah. on on we, mostly anything. That big one we lost, that monster one we just saw crash, like. We, we had him we had 30 him feet after about yeah. what 45 50 minutes yeah. like yeah. and eventually broke but right. um you can do it like matt was saying it's just you got to have the guys that have the experience that can do it sure. you know what i mean it's so, easier the bigger fish the, the the issue with the bigger fish is you have to fight those fish as hard as possible the entire time or the fight's just going to take forever yeah and i mean we've been on fish for eight and a half hours yeah like you, eight that's a work shift yeah. that we've been on one fish for that's yeah, so long if, like if you if you give them anything they're just gonna take the fish that the fully. fish that we broke right. i go how long do you think we fought that for an hour and a half he goes like 45 minutes like you don't realize how long yeah. an hour of fighting yeah, one time, time fish tends is to um with, with the with the intensity of these fish the time tends to freeze it's almost like if it's rough or if it's foggy or if it's lightning or if it's raining all that stuff kind of goes into a blur when you're dealing with the fish. You don't care about anything else, you know, time, anything. That's what you tend to concentrate on. So when so when does tuna, <clears throat> like, generally speaking, when does somebody, it start? If I were to, so the, the bigger ones will always show up first. You know, um, they're more What month? Um, Mid-June, mid late June, mid-June. Mid yeah, we call those runners. Those are the fish that, you know, the first one's here, and they're usually surface feeders in groups of like three or four. And they'll come through here one day, go on the next, yep. and they're on their way up the coast. They're going to Maine, New Hampshire, PEI. Yep. And, you know, they're looking for a place to summer over. Right. They're just um, blowing up bait on their way through. Right. This year, um, like, for example, that third picture down on the left, that was July 9th. I remember chatting with you, and this was late June, mid-June, and you're like, ah, it's not really hard, happening yet. And then I called you like a week week later, and you're like, dude, the entire ocean is lit up with it's like they just they day showed day. up. Well, overnight, yeah, it was they amazing. showed up. The entire coastline had was was void of tuna, and I think it was July second. They were everywhere. 
What is the best month to target bluefin on the Cape? Your in your opinion, a recreational one. Sure. Yes. Yeah. September. Commercial fish, fish over seventy three. August. August. Yeah. And then um, just the sheer numbers show up, yeah, the, the, or the, the weather's the, consistent. Well, August, both. August, July, and August, the weather's usually incredible. Right. You know, it's really, really good weather um, because hurricane season is. And, and then when does the season typically wrap up? Typically wrap up right about now. Gotcha. Right about now. There's fish. So the fish that we're catching now are bigger. So we haven't seen a, a, a class of 60 to 65 inch fish with any consistency this year. We can get one or two here and there, but we didn't get a consistent class of fish that size. Right. Um, we had a huge group um, of 40, 45 to 47 inch fish last year. Those fish all came back this year and they're all 52 to 55. Gotcha. Um, and the fish we're catching now are 63, 64, 65. So does it wrap up now because the fish are moving on or because the weather can get just shitty and it's just, it, 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 you got to call it quits at some I, point? Or yeah, you will, yeah, the weather the weather is going to force you off the water. Um, the, the water temperature is going to drop, chase the bait out. Yep. The fish are going to move. And then finally, nature just takes over and the fish are like, we're out of here. You know, it's just, you know, you can look at it like salmon and steelhead. The water can be low. But eventually, nature's going to take over, and they're they're going to run. So in general, these fish are going to show up. For those that have no idea what this speech, they're going to show up around mid June. Okay, let's just say mid to late yeah. June. Mid 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 June to the beginning of July is a safe bet. Okay, that you're going to start seeing some tuna. Around. And then they start to move on and migrate south. Yes. In what October, November? Yeah. Does, yeah. There's still some fish around in December. A yeah, couple, the bigger ones, the bigger ones, bigger ones, and then by the end of December, they're pretty much gone. Right? Yeah, pretty much gone. I mean, you could, you know, people say that they're fishing off the Cape for them, but they're really not fishing off. The, they're fishing sixty-eight miles off. Yeah. Right. That's not really the Cape anymore. Right. Is that so, just because the water stays warmer out there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's more. So you're the, getting big, close, the big you're ones more get tolerated. Close. Yeah. For so where yeah. are these fish that you're well, targeting? No, excuse me for a second. Go ahead. Tuna can tuna are unique in their ability to change their body temperature. Okay. So they can change their body temperature up to 30 degrees either way okay. whenever they want. Sure. So that's where the warm-blooded part comes in with them, which is amazing. So they can be in 30-degree water, and they can raise their body temperature or vice versa. Sure. So let's say these fish move on in <laughs> December, like <laughs> your fish. Okay, okay. we're talking about the Cape Cod one. fish. Oh, Cape Cod. Okay. Where are these fish between December and June? Oh. Where, where are they headed to? Well, they're going to go... There's a split body of fish, and this has been up for debate um, for, for a while now, on where they go. And a lot of the tagging programs we do, it suggests that a good percentage of them spend their winter over in the Mediterranean. So they'll run across the ocean. Yep. And What about North Carolina? I always hear the winter fishing, North there's Carolina. A, there's, so there's a body of fish that either leaves the Cape and goes directly over, or there's a, a, a portion of that body of fish that goes south. North Carolina. Okay. And then once they're done there, there's this very small percentage of fish that we found that go either south to the Bahamas. Are there fish in the Gulf? Yeah, that's... Those fish. And the, do those these fish intermingle at some point in time? Yeah. They There's been studies lately that have shown that... I'm not asking to be a, a scientist here. I'm just curious. Right. No, no, no. You know from what, I'm what saying? I hear, and I'm not going sure, yeah. to pretend Generally to be Generally speaking. Either, that they're, they're suggesting that there's a small percentage of fish that actually breed, and they spawn in the Gulf. Interesting. Um, what kind of spawners are they? Broadcast spawners? Do you not know? I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, what? how I, does that... I have no idea. No idea? No. Twitter are very, very... The guy who was trying to pen raise them, um, to farm raise them, found it incredibly difficult and the millions of dollars he put into it because the, everything has to be so perfect in order for them to spawn between temperature and salinity and speed. And Interesting. And food, the type of food they're eating around that, that time yep. period is very unique. So um, uh, most of the tagged fish I've ever caught have always been tagged from Madrid. You know, um, tagged two, three, four, five, six years prior. Gotcha. So they've made that trek from the Mediterranean Sea in Spain over to the Cape five or six times. Sure. Where do the majority come from that, like, show up in, you know, in the beginning of the season? Mediterranean. Like, okay, that's where their majority is coming yeah. from. That's crazy. Yeah, so that was one of my questions. Like, you're fishing the Cape all the time. In that June through November time frame, mm -hmm. 
where else coastal wise can you target that same body of fish because like i've fished in new jersey i mean okay with the exception of the last couple of years because there was a body of bluefin tuna in new jersey right. but like you're looking at the shoreline when you're in cape like we're targeting bluefin i can see the beach yeah. i'd see people out sun tanning but like that doesn't happen in maryland it doesn't really happen in southern no, jersey that's... it did in northern jersey last year which right. was unique but so like where else in those summer months can you target these fish is it canada is it Maine yeah, PEI. is it PEI? PEI. Um, are they near Rhode Island? Are they near Long Island? Y- most of the places you can catch them, you, I mean, you can see land depending on how high the land is. Yep. You know, if the bluffs are high. Um, you could see land probably 15 miles off. Sure. 20 miles off. Um, that's, a, that's, that's far. For sure. You know, um, the Cape, and, and I, after all these years, it might be a shock to some people, but I've never even fished in New York or Jersey for tuna. Well, tradi- I, I, traditionally, those bluefin, like, they they want to be around the Cape yeah. in the summertime. Like, that's their summer. It's like how people that live in the country, they want to go to the beach. They want to go to yeah. Jersey. They want to go to the Hamptons. They want to go to Cape like Cod. the geography of the Cape gives you an advantage it, it, in terms of targeting it, them. Correct. Not there's there's multiple much. inlets. Right. There's you know? marinas. And, you like, can, there's no point in going to New York or Jersey to target them I, for but, you. But, but I want to go down there. And try it one time because I want to understand somebody else's fishery. Sure. When I understand somebody else's fishery, it'll help me better understand what we have. For sure. And when when I get a lot of people to come up with me from that area, they always describe the Cape as magical. And I can't understand what they mean by that because I have nothing to compare it to. Sure. Yeah. Is That's it why I want to go down there and I want to see what else. Sure. It, is it because you got to go half the distance to get off? No, to they're get like, to dude, you have whales like... over here. You have endless bait. Yeah. You have turtles. You have mola molas and sunfish swimming around. He goes, you have 800 pounders jumping over there. You have 45 inches here. Yeah. And there's striped bass right there, too. You know? And seals yeah. and, and great seals whites. And great whites. It's like a freaking zoo aqua- aquarium, right. as that guy said. You know? And they're feeding on anything you could possibly imagine. It is unique. What's cool about the bluefin on the Cape. Like I said, I've targeted tuna before. I got a bunch of buddies. I'm, I'm very grateful. I get to go places like I've, you know, big eyes, yellow fin, long fin, you know, you name it. Mm-hmm. What's cool about the blue fin is they're so close to shore. Mm-hmm. They are probably the, the largest tuna of, of those yes. species yes, by far. But like you would think like, you know, these big yellow fin, these 200 pound big eyes, some long fin, like those fish would be closer to shore. They're smaller, but they're not. They're, they're way further than right, what bluefin and are. And they're very temperature dependent. It's yeah. the complete opposite of what you, I would think. Right. Like smaller fish closer to shore, bigger fish they want to be away. Not bluefin. Right. Like no, I mean, no. like big eyes, like big eyed tuna. You're pretty much only going to find those in the canyons. I think one of the major reasons why that is is because tuna need more food. Bluefin, bluefin in particular need more sure. food because of their size. Because they grow bigger. Yeah, like big eyes. What max out like two, three hundred pounds? No, big eye can yeah, three hundred B- pounds. Bigger, is a big big eye. Right, that's a big big know? eye. But bluefin, granders, right. thousand pounds bigger. Thousand like, pounds. How old is a thousand pound? Like how old the tuna get? Uh, uh, that fish in the second photo in the middle is probably the one your hands on. No, no the below that. All oh, the ones, the ones that's swimming with. Yeah, that, that, that nope. fish, that fish is probably is twenty-five. Nice. It's a video. That fish is probably 25, 30 years old. How uh, many pounds was that? Um, or we taped, we taped it out. That fish was uh, like one hundred and ten inches. So that fish was probably in the. Yeah, this is Henry on the left, and that's Billy. Who just we just doubled up here. And these are bolt-on fish. Where look at Billy, can't he tries and he right there he can't even move the rod. <laughs> And these are, these Stellas are pretty much maxed out. And, um, you know, we're probably fishing 40, 45 pounds of drag, you know, on these reels. And, I mean, these were, these, these fish were just, these fish were just, they were so, so big. And it took a, a very, very unique Looks so type sick. of angler um, to target these fish. This was one of the other ones. Pause that, that, Matt, day. if you can. Maybe you can't. You can't. It's no, an you Instagram can't. Video. Instagram video. Um, and it's a very unique. So here in particular, this fish was tail wrapped. So when a fish runs hard away from you, directly in line with where you are, 
um, the line will go around their tails. And these pelagic fish have such hard tails yeah. that the line will make a loop around their tail and it won't come off. I now, have it, I've had it happen with Albies. Right. Yeah, and here in thing. particular, see, you know. Thanks, Matt. So we, um, our big fish got tail wrapped. Yeah, we felt it. That we, the, the big one we hooked and lost, we hooked it, it dumped the, almost spooled us. How yeah, many yeah. yards of braid on that reel? Up uh, three, 350. I maybe? mean, just almost like he had to get but on. But it was the, instant. The reel was instant. making noise that it shouldn't normally sure. make. You can the, tell. It was, the drag was beyond. And like, then the its fish just kind of stopped and we kind of worked it back to the boat slow. Yeah. And, and I was doing it. I knew something went up when I was gaining on this fish. And then all of a sudden I started filming Matt. He goes, this, this thing's tail wrapped, and you see the rod just go, da, 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 da. came on tail wrapped. Yeah. You hear him go, just came unwrapped. Yeah. It just dumped yeah. another 200 yards of braid instantly. Well, yeah. it probably shuts them down when they're tail wrapped and you're finding them back. It's their it's motor. And the harder you, when they get tail wrapped like that, the, the problem, you have, you have to pull them very, very hard. Because the harder you pull them, the, the more motor you take away. Sure. You know, because they yeah. can't move their tail anymore. But like, they're probably probably shuts them down overall, though. Because you're they, drowning. They them. constantly need water you're, going you're, on you're, every yeah, gill, you're, so. you're drowning them. Yeah. You know. So yeah. here, for example, here's a video. If you want to look at the one in the middle on the right hand side, one over, to the right, that one is an example of what Brooks was talking about. How these fish are so close to shore here. Is that out your back door? Yeah, this is. these are fish that I actually saw from binoculars. Jesus. From what, my front door. What bait are they blowing up on there? They're blowing up on bunker. Bunker. You know, pogies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And nobody was targeting these fish. <laughs> That's ridiculous. And I was taking guys in here, and we were, she could see the bait. And we were catching four or five a day. And all these fish were just, abs they were just massive. You know, these Dude, were all the insane. eight, nine hundreds. <laughs> It is insane, bro. It's crazy, bro. And I mean, now this, look at this school of bunker and the amount of tuna that go under it. <laughs> when you see that in real life, like I got like a smidgen of Did that, but okay. And we're so close here. Look, for example, Brooks, didn't mean to interrupt, but we're right offshore and here my buddy's like, yep, we're on. And we hook up in the front of my boat. I was only fishing one rod. You could see how many rods I had with me. Thanks, Matt. Dude, those bunk, like full size bunkers spraying like that. Just spraying, like, look at the, that video right there. Yeah. Dude, you know, that's. This I, is my favorite video. Look. Watch this. For those of you that are just listening, just <laughs> picture acres of bunker just spraying out of the water with giant fish underneath yeah. them. That's awesome. Bro. And this was, this in, in all the years, I, I we saw this for three weeks. Dude. This is just, I mean, this is what you live for. Yeah, this is, I'm getting chills. I, don't, right I here, am too. Right now, all watching this. And I don't I'm even do who, this, and this is what, I just, this is incredible. And I'm the one who filmed this. Oh my There's God. There's one of them. Yeah, it's insane. And we were letting them swim in them. And now this is what me and Brooks wanted. Just normal size. This is just normal size, 55, 60 inches out back, you know, and you just see. That's the stuff. Just, oh my God. <laughs> if you guys, thanks, Matt. If, if you're listening and you want to see what we're looking at, what's your Instagram handle, Matt? Tighten Up Charters, T-I-G-H-T-E-N, Up Charters. I highly suggest you go to this Instagram page and you'll be stuck on it for two hours until your phone battery <laughs> goes good dead. good content for sure. Because the videos, like your content, like... I'm on Instagram all the time. I work for Cortland. I follow a lot of guys on Instagram because it's our job. But this page is just chucked full of epic shit. And, any, mean, and anybody, anybody who goes on the page, feel free to message me on the page and ask me questions. You know, I'm always available to people. I love teaching people. For I sure. I love helping people. So, so that was fishery. one of the next segments I wanted to get in. How do people find you and how do they book a trip? It's not just your Instagram. Do you have a website? Right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty hard to not find me. Um, I mean, we're, we're, I'm pretty much everywhere. So if you just Google tighten up charters, um, I'd probably pop up. Um, there it is. Thanks, there's Matt. There's the initial website. Tighten up charters, CC. We did that for, for Cape Cod. Cape Cod. Got Cause it. Cause there was another one in Maryland. For sure. And, um, again, we would just wanted to be unique. So they can reach out to you. They could find your contact info on here. Yeah. I mean, or DM you through Instagram, right? Yeah, Instagram. You know, my phone numbers are all over the place. They can always call me and text me. 
and um, I spend a lot of time with um, with customers, and I want to know um, who they are, what they're about, and For I want sure. them to know what I'm about yeah. also. Because we're you have to get a little personal with the people because we're going to be spending a lot of time together. Oh yeah, you know, um, ten miles offshore on a. 27 foot boat for right. nine hours. Right. You know, um, this year is going or a little longer. different than the last couple of years. Um, I have about half my season booked already for 2023, which is very early. Um, well, that's what you want as a business owner. I, I do. I do. Um, and Re I, repeat customers, you got some new ones sprinkled I, I in have, there? I have both. And I want what I wanted to do is I wanted to um, limit the repeat customers to a certain amount of trips. Because I wanted to give new people an opportunity to have an availability. I'm sure you got some available. people that are itching to go, and you're like, "I'm just booked." I'm booked, um, but I can't spite the people for you know thinking ahead, sure, and booking in yeah, advance. I hear you, because you know they took the time to do it. They put the deposit up a year in advance. Yep, and I'm going to sit on that money, and and hopefully the day works out and the weather works out for everybody. All right, so someone gets a hold of you. You miraculously have a day open. Mm -hmm. Weather's good. What is your daily schedule of chartering? Not from a client perspective, what can they expect? Like, what is your schedule? What time are you waking up in the morning? Oh, again, Let's start there. On the time of the year. Yes. So um, midsummer, of course, you know, the sun rises earlier than it does in the whole year. I'm Especially out there. Right, 2.45, I'm up. 2.45, 3 o'clock, I'm up. A.M. for those of you that... Correct. <laughs> A.M., right? A.M. Without the sun. And now depending on where I'm launching... Um, I want to launch. Um, the ramps typically get busy around five. Right, you trail your boat. I Some people my, think your boat's out of dock. No, no, my you, boat is you put your boat That's in and out every too. day. I take my boat in and out every day. day. I think that adds another element of just like. But accessibility. But, yeah, exactly. I was going to say. I know, but like that's, you're correct. Where the fish are, you can go oh, to them. Oh, just another element it's of just, difficulty? Yeah, for, for you know. It's, it's just, not, though. I know. You get used to it. But for but me. But it gives you an advantage at the same time. It, it does. It, it gives you, it, it might seem like it's not convenient to do, but, you know, the guys who have their boats on the docks, they got to tote their ice down every day. Yep. And, the you know, the bigger boats, you know, they can lock up their rods and stuff. But you know, I have I wash the boat with fresh water every day when I get home. I wash the trailer. I can fuel up. Go to the commercial dock to get the ice. Yep, and then bring it back. You know, bring it back. And you've been with me. You know, you see me how quick I put the boat in and take it out. It's incredible. I mean, it's a matter of seconds. I that's one of the things. Like if you're not you know good on boats and putting them in and out, it's it's like kind of a daunting task. You're like, oh man, I gotta back this boat down. Yeah. But like these guys that I'm lucky to go with, like you just make it look so easy. Sure. And that boat is so big. Like just dude. If some of you have never been to Cape Cod before, these roads are skinny, bro. Yeah. These barely fit a truck, let alone two vehicles going the opposite directions with a 27-foot center yeah. console on right. the back. And, then, and it's a foot wider than every other 27-foot He's foot got console. the window down talking to me like this, doing that. I'm like, you see this little Prius right here? He's like, yeah, they'll move. They'll move. You know? It's it's It's, dude, se it's, it's second crazy. nature to somebody who does it. You For know? sure. You um, do it every day. It's so, you, like, so you're getting up 245. Anything. You're putting the boat in. I'm this, launching the, the boat, so typically, so the, the, the ramps will get busy about around 5 o'clock. You'll see a bunch of boats come within a matter of five minutes. Yep. I always want to my boat in the water and my truck parked before, by the time way that before that. You so, said guys were putting in their boats before that, sleeping on their boat, anchoring yeah. it, waiting for their clients to show up. Yeah, they were doing that on commercial Peak days. Peak season. Yeah, on commercial days. Um, but, yeah, I'm not going to do that. But, so, so, you, so you go out, you fish, you know. Eight nine hours, like we we only went out for like six or seven. Right. We, we every, got our fish. We're every, like, every, like we're every good, day bro. is different. You know what I mean? So, um, when are you typically returning back to the ramp? It depends when your on how over? we're doing, or if you got to fish on for eight hours, or yeah, it depends on how we're doing, the people's moods, how the day's going, how the bite's going, how the weather's going. There's so many variables. Yep. Yeah. Um, I tell a lot of people, I go, you guys aren't trapped out here. I know these are eight to ten hour trips, but if you guys are done, tell me. Yeah, you know, you don't have to stay out here. We can go in. Um, we've we've gone home at nine o'clock on certain days because people will do eight fish, right? And they're like, dude, we're done. Let's go home and have a beer. I mean, that's what we don't care. That's what you and I like. We got our fish at noon. We looked at each other. We're like, we saw everything. Right. We got our fish. Right. We already had hooked that one. We fought it for quite some time, and then we ended up getting a smaller one. We put the fish in the boat. We took a bunch of pictures. We st stuck around for half an hour more. And I said to him, I said, it's done. 
He said, yeah. I said, it's done. I said, you might see a couple pop here and there, but the, it's done. Yeah. And, and a bunch of other guys stuck around because they weren't so lucky. Um, and I didn't day. see shit. Right. It was over. Do you ever have people that want to stay out for like longer than 10 hours, even if you guys are catching them? Yeah. Then yeah. But I tell them, I, I said, listen, I, I said, if <laughs> even you want to like dark. Right. I said, if you want to stay in Walmart past closing, I'm not going to tell you no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. just because we're on a boat doesn't mean this isn't a business. <laughs> yeah. For you sure. know, because no, businesses are so run you, the same so it's way. a good way to put it. So you wrap up right. your trip. True. You pull the boat. Then what? You got to wash it down. You got to get, you look over your gear. You got to get yeah. ice. Like, yeah, I mean. When are you going to bed for the, I mean, you're tough. doing how many trips? In, say the weather's good every single every day. day. You're booked every day, yeah. right? Seven days a week. Yeah. Some for how, for, in, in, my wife Crystal will say to me, she'll be like, uh, the, it's gonna it's gonna be blowing like hell on Thursday. I'm like, oh thank God. Yeah, yeah. You get know? a little break. But then you don't get a break. Because all the stuff you haven't had time to do <laughs> Gear yeah, prep. for up a week you, or two all has to get done. Maintenance on the boat, on the, the trailer, trailer, oil changes. Yeah. On the boat Rods, and all this stuff. And I don't want to do that stuff when I get home. I want a day to do it. Sure. And then I got to go to certain stores. I got to get certain gear, certain more materials, re-rig and look at wind downs and check over the boat and put stuff in. It's, you know, I'll say I get back to the dock at two o'clock. Um, typically. Typically. Yep. You know, um, I'm only 15 minutes from, from yep. the ramp. I'll stop. I'll fill up the boat, top off the boat. I'll get back. I'll rinse off the boat, rinse off the gear. Gear goes in the house. I'll run into town, get two totes of ice, bring that back, throw it in the boat. And then start. So do you, it's insane, first of so all. So how many weeks do you do that for? Like mid-June to the end of September? You no, said I won't basically. say mid-June. Okay. Um, so all the trips that I said I have in the book for next year, um, not one of them is in July. Okay. July, not one of them is in June. You start them in July. Is that what you meant? No, not one of them is in July. Oh, really? They're Why all that? August and September. Okay. Gotcha. Because July has never, hasn't historically been known as a great month for tuna okay for for what the, the the reason people book with me is they want to catch the fish on light tackle july hasn't been known for that okay so this year when these fish showed up in force the first week in july it took everybody by surprise nobody had trips booked and you were that. open i was open completely and all i did was post one video and i said they're here let's go guys and i remember the next morning i was out and we had eight fish I think by six o'clock, a.m. Yeah, a.m. And we weren't. Um, um, so when you came out with me, mm -hmm. we came across the bay. We went past Wood End, yep. And then we went right around the race, yep. These fish were before the race, a mile off the beach, out your back door, basically. Yeah, so they were a quarter mile outside of where we were before we were outside. I mean, so picture the this: they were so, in the bay. So Matt lives like what four or five miles from Provincetown Race Point. Yeah. Like, I mean, as, as the road goes, as the road you know. goes, correct. I remember getting to your house last year for the first time. We didn't fish. We just went to dinner. It's the first time we met. I'm right, like, hey, right. let's let's get to know each other, whatever. Right. And I go, yeah, you ever see fish out back here? And he goes, you didn't see the video that I posted last week? I go, yeah. He goes, that was right here. I go, how how did you know? The one we to, just watched? Yeah. I go, how would yeah. you know to fish here? He goes, I walked out the back door and they were fucking blowing up on the surface. So he's like, yeah. you can see a 400 pound fish from a pretty far away. Yeah. Yeah. And that's when I'm like, this place is epic. It looks like somebody's throwing Volkswagens in the water. Dude, when yeah. you're from a distance, like yeah. you're on a beach, it's Cape Cod, it's gorgeous. And there's giant fish out the back. It's like one of the coolest places in the, I mean, if you're a fisherman, it, you can't get much better than a lot that. Of a lot of people call me and they'll say stuff. So for example, before you ask me who Matt D'Ambrose is, yeah. right? My nephew. He called me, and this is before he had his boat, so he had a little bit of a runaround boat right now. Really wasn't geared towards tuna. He called me and said, hey, you got to get in here. There's giants blowing up. And I said, okay. But I didn't really hear um, the excitement in his voice that I figured I would have heard if it was really giants blowing up. So I made my way in there, and I got in there. I was like, holy shit, this is giants blowing up. Like, he, he should have said, you got to get in here now. Yeah, yeah. Better and then we went in there. And I had double bass trips that day, and I called my wife, and I said, I'm bringing my first bass trip home. I said, can you get my 80s and bring them down to the harbor and meet me there in 20 minutes? She 80s said, meaning your tuna reels, my, my, for those of you who don't giant, know what an 80 is. My giant reels. Which we'll get 80 to. 80 wides. Yeah, yes. the, the 80 wides. And she said, okay. So I had a single guy on my second trip, and I said to the guy, we're going to have a change of plans. I said, in instead of catching striped bass, do you want to go catch giant bluefin tuna instead? And he said, yeah, I think I'd be okay with that. And uh, 
we we went over and we're coming back out of the harbor and I put my binoculars on it and I could see the explosions from three miles away. I said, all right, they're still there. So we went over there and we had a fish on and as quick as I could put a grab, snag a bunker and put one on, we had one 30 seconds later. Mm. You know, it's epic. I think that we, guy. we ended up. So after he fought that one, he goes, "This is too hard. This I don't want to do this. Right? Yeah. It's too hard." He goes, "Can we go catch some striped bass?" I said, "Are you sure?" <laughs> and he goes, "Yeah." So we went around to Herring Cove and started catching some stripers, and I could see this look on his face. And he goes, uh, "And I go what?" And he goes, "Can we go back there and do that again?" <laughs> I said, "Yeah, that's right. Okay, that's we can go." So we went right back there, and we ended up getting another one. The one we ended up getting, the other was was a little north of 900, you know. Pounds. That's ridiculous. And those fish were in 27 feet of water. Insane. That's the coolest part is those <laughs> big, the, how big those fish are and how shallow I do regret they it, though. In retrospect, I wish I had thought I would have loved to have jumped in the water with a GoPro. Right. And, and seen what that looked like from underneath. Until you got swallowed. You know, <laughs> no, you, would, you wouldn't have had any issues there. You know? What are... So when what are, you, go ahead, Matt. When do you run the bass trips? Then you just inter you just intertwine them early with season, the right? Stuff. Yeah, the bass trips. So, um, you, so I don't really advertise for it. Okay, but it's just like word um, of mouth. June, July, people you know, and then a lot of July, I get a lot of people on vacation. Yeah, that you know they just want to go fishing. And this is before you're mainly starting up the bluefin charters, right? For but, the year, but I do less and less bass trips every year, and that's not by choice. That's just the way things have worked out. Sure. So my my schedule. I don't like booking bass trips. I'm not saying I won't, but I tend not to book bass trips after like mid July. Okay. Because I don't want to. If I'm open tomorrow and you call me and you say I want to book a bass trip, I say fine. But I don't want to book a bass trip far out in advance because I'm gonna get a call for that day eventually. And there's tuna for a tuna yeah. trip. Yeah, yeah. And then I say I can't take you tuna fishing because I have a bass trip in the right. book. Right. Yeah. You never and want I, that to happen. I don't want that to happen. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to have to give the trip away. Um, I just kind of want to stick with the game, and I, I enjoy targeting tuna more. So for those of you listening, thinking you're like, I'm going to charter for tuna, this sounds great. Why don't you give us an insight on your expenses? Yeah. I'm talking daily expenses. I'm talking yearly expenses. I think that's kind of something that's overlooked for people that may not have talked to someone that charters as much as you do. Um, fuel, ice, like give us a breakdown. I mean, generally, like what you're running into um, – how much is an oil change to change their boat? How many my, times a year are you doing that? Oh, so I do about 800 hours a year on my motors. We do oil changes every um, 100 hours. Yep. You do lower unit changes and you do motor oil changes and oil filter changes. Those changes are 40, 80, 160, 200, $240 per Per. How much fuel are you burning on a given day? I know there's some days where on, right. on some, when you go out back and there's right. fish giants. On, on average, I'm burning probably 60 to 80 gallons a day. No shit. Yeah. Uh, what did we burn? 40? Yeah, maybe. Maybe. We, we were done at noon. Didn't Because we were done at noon. We didn't, didn't run that really far. run all over the place. Didn't the, need to. The days that I burn a lot of fuel are the days that it's not good. Right. It's not great because I'm looking. Yeah. And I'm trying to find them. The days that I can find them easy and quick, those are the days that are good. Do you, you ever... Know? Do you ever you get your own bait for bait days? Or are you purchasing that? I, or you're well, like going out and you're getting some bunker? Yeah, I mean, we're going to catch. Anytime we ha we're bait fishing, we're catching our own bait. Gotcha. You know, so it's bunker, it's mackerel, it's bluefish, Snagging it's squid. Snagging half beaks. Yeah, half beaks. The only one I've ever snagged. Um, pretty immaculate. Do you um, use a cast specimen. net to get bunker? A cast net, depending on yeah, how deep yeah, they are, where yeah, they are, or snagging yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. You know, um, but yeah, we're always catching our own bait, and depending on where you're fishing, you know. Yeah, bait changes. Bait That's changes. what people like when you're inside, like out your back door, versus the back side of Cape Cod, the ocean side. You want to be fishing with a live bluefish if you're in the bay. Correct, or yeah. bunker in that case. And bunker. bluefish or bunker, Snapper, right? Then you or like an actual blue no, like a, no, like, oh, a, like really? a like a, a bluefish like that we would catch on a fly fish. rod and be like, this is really? incredible. Yeah, yeah, that goes as bait. I remember last year uh, I fished with. Joey Manizela from Woozy, yeah. uh, one of the photographers that we work with sure. in Rhode Island, and all we did was catch bluefish all day. Mm -hmm. Well, those were all bait for the, the following day for his is, tuna charter. Is that the biggest bait bluefin will eat? Um, is that, like their, eat, is that their biggest forage pretty they'll much? Eat, they'll like, eat, like, eat they, anything they can put in their mouth. Will they eat striped bass? Anything they can put in their mouth. They'll eat stripers? Oh, yeah. Really? Yeah. 
Dilly, anything it makes sense. Can... I just never, you never hear about people. I mean, not that. I think blue fish are very. It would be acceptable. To there, really there's use a lot of them bait, in in, but... in that bayside. Yeah, and that's just you know the bunker and bluefish in there, and then like that day that Matt and I went, um, they were on butterfish, which are very hard to get tuna when they're on butterfish. They were on half beaks, which we caught one of those on accident, mm -hmm. and then there's you know <laughs> yeah it's they're ridiculous. on sand eels when you're jigging for them. There's yeah. there's just that's what makes well, that's, those fish that's pretty why they're neat. There. That's yes. why they're there, and that's yeah. why the big fish are there because the I'm trying amount to look of for forage. A specific picture. So when you're fishing the bluefish, you're just mm -hmm. chunking them. No, like they're live. live. You're throwing your live line in yeah. bluefish what? that big. Yeah, Jesesus. On a harness. How are you? How are you <laughs> rigging ridiculous. that up? You bridle them. Bridle them, or you could just toss them out. What um, is what does bridling mean? Bridling means um, we, we could use any of the braid for it too. Right. So bridling, there's a couple ways to do it. You can do yeah. it with rubber bands, um, little latch needle. It's just so the hook is exposed when that tuna <clears throat> eats it, and and the hook, is the hook isn't pull out on top right. of them. Yeah, okay. it sits yeah. on the top on their of their back. So a lot of the ways... Like so I, you would typically hook live line a fish. Yes. Yeah, right. you would typically live line it. So but you're not actually a, penetrating the fish. You're using a band. You're using a needle. Okay, a needle. Okay. That's what you're putting through the fish to in order them. to hook. Oh, okay, okay. So on the you. small fish, um, like mackerel stuff, Yeah. you know the rubber bands that you see people put on their braces? Yeah. Those little yeah. tiny... Yeah. So if you take a rubber band with a latch needle and you put the hook through the rubber band... The, on the other side of the rubber band, you put the latch needle, you pull it through the fish okay. with the other side, yeah. then you take the other side of the rubber band, that goes on the other side of the hook. Okay. And then send them. Nice. What is, yeah, that makes sense. For chartering, what is your favorite method of catching fish versus your personal favorite method? It's the same. Of, same? I wouldn't charter if I didn't love it. No, I'm saying like... No, no, no. But, th but that's why... Jigging, they, that's, topwater, live no, that's, bait. That, like, that, that's why they overlap. Because it's I the only, same. Yeah. Well, what is it? Top water. Top water. Yeah. 100%. Racing, racing at fish. And that's why I have one of the fastest boats around. Because I want to what get What is fish. your boat? It's a 27 Onslow Bay with twin 350s They're the fastest? It. Yeah. Twin 350s? It's, yeah. It's high, high 60 miles an hour. Jesus. So I never want to be last to a feed. Right. And I never want to say, oh, man, we couldn't get there in time. Sure. You know? So, um, you know, I, I had to go after, you know, top quality and I think the customers deserve it, you know. Agree. That's that's why you know I have no issues using you know some of the best line on the market because it's top quality and my customers deserve it. Sure. My boat is top quality. My gear is top quality. I'm charging a premium, but I'm only charging a premium because everything that comes with my premium price is premium product. Right. Hooks, lures, rods, reels, yeah. boat, yes. fuel, everything. line, everything. Yeah, experience, and um, I don't do it for a job as much as I do it because I love it. What else can you tell potential clients that might be listening about chartering that maybe we haven't covered yet? Is there anything, is there some big topics that you're just like, this is what you need to know or stuff that you're just going to go I, over from, with them from, on the phone? Oh, from a client? From yeah. A, like what, what else that maybe we haven't covered that like something big that a client might need? To every know? day is different. You know, um, uh, granted they are fish, you know, we have a beat on them. We have a pretty extensive network of captains that we mm -hmm. work with, um, trustworthy guys. But um, every day is different. You don't know what the day is going to bring, what the next day is going to bring. Um, usually I can say to the, the, the clients is on a, from a day to day, um, if we're not catching fish, there's, there's probably not a good chance that everybody else is. Right. You know, um, if, we are, if we're having a real slow day, most of the other guys I know are also. Yeah. You got a pretty killer network of guys. I mean, yeah. between your phone going off, the radio, which you don't want to use is too much. You know what yeah. I mean? Keeping it to a cell phone is very important. I mean, like there was times where someone had called you, gave you coordinates, mm -hmm. which are huge. Yeah. You know, this, that, and the other thing. And I'm like, you want to get? You told me your boat goes sixty. Why aren't we going sixty to get over this feed? He goes, you don't blaze over there because everyone else is going to follow you. Yeah, you go at a decent sure. clip you don't want to stand want to up in like the front of the boat hurry, yes yeah, you yeah. don't want to point don't want to draw attention you can sure. see it so you know you can see there's little telltale signs that you can see <laughs> from a, um, a charter's perspective or even a For recreational sure. guys it's out there a lot yeah they can see if we're got a bunch of boats sitting around all of a sudden one boat just <laughs> floors it and hammers it and you look over and you're like where's he going there's a yeah. guy up in the front of the boat going oh, he's pretty seeing <laughs> yeah. point and you're like all right where, pretty where's obvious. he going yeah and you look and that's what happens is if that guy's boat's not fast enough, and I see what he's looking at, 
I'm going to beat him there. Yeah. Even though I'm not yeah, even yeah, moving. Yeah, right. Yeah. I'm going to beat him there. So you want to do a little low key. Um, it's nice to get to a feed and have it to yourself. And that's something that, yeah. not that, not that you need to, but when we went out. But at least like rolling up on the, at least it was a, some of it to yourself. Before yes. Everyone else it was, shows a, up. it was a Tuesday <laughs> morning. It was slicked out. The fishing wasn't easy. It was but there, not easy. There wasn't that many people out there and it was freaking enjoyable. Yeah. Like there was, there was. Those videos that we showed earlier, yeah. and there's other ones that we'll get to. Tuna fishing is not boats, relaxing. Nothing, not even nothing. close to us. Yeah, tuna fishing is not relaxing. People say, <laughs> no, oh, I had a nice no. relaxing day on the water. Don't start tuna fishing. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing relaxing. Yeah. That was probably one of the more relaxing days you did have when we went out. Yeah, well, just because I had no pressure. I know. That's why. It was, it was fun. I, I had, I, had, I have a fisherman on the boat. I have somebody who knows the game. Yeah. Um, You know, and, and you know, there was no client. You know, sure. money being exchanged, yeah. and you're just going fishing for we're fun. Just going with fishing your for fun. Yeah, you know, that's what. How is it... the um... go Sorry, ahead, man? How is the uh, like social life between guides or captains out there on Cape Cod? Like, do do a lot of the captains help each other, or is it more like I, I'm sure some get competitive, obviously, but like overall, well, how I've, would you say I, that for for the past couple of years, I've tried to, I've wanted people to talk more. Sure, and um, there's a lot of. You know that's mine that's not yours i found this no you found this you can't go here i go here there's a lot of that you know banter that goes back and forth but bottom line is is all these guides and client and and you know charter captains we all have the same goal in mind here we we all have to get our clients on fish and it shouldn't be about i'm better you're better it shouldn't be about any of that yeah. it should be better for the entire industry yeah for if sure everybody comes here and succeeds yeah and like just the protection of the fish and, and like, the protection of the fish without the and, fish you guys are right yeah you know, we're, we're, we're asked out we got nothing you know yeah. so over the past three four five years we we have a really good group of guys that we coordinate with and we talk with on a daily basis like we pretty much always know where we're going when we leave the dock in the morning you know um yeah. where you're starting where we're starting where we're starting in a general area because you're not going one one spot all day. Sometimes you do. This, but, is, this oh, is like in, in August. In August, we were going with to one spot all day, within like a two square mile area, and we would all get there. And this is when we were digging. We'd all get there, and everybody knew it is one area, but it really wasn't that area. And we're we're a network, and everybody knows we're a network. So that they find one of us, they'll tend to stick around us and hover around us because they know that we're tied in with six or seven or eight other boats there's a reason why six or seven of you are in the same spot right sure no 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 even if we're not in the same spot they'll watch one of us and hang out near one of us gotcha we just to try off, to get in on any right if we take yeah. off they yeah. know why we're taking off <laughs> if we don't take off they know that that area that the rest of us are in is no better than what we're there are we now interesting you know, it makes total sense. So we would go into that area and we would, it was hard because in, in August there was no fish on the surface. It was all, they were on the bottom. They were all jigged. Um, bottom on fish. sand deals? Yeah, they were on sand deals. So we had a tough time. If they weren't in the same exact spot, we would have to look for the whales. Yep. Or we would just have to drive around and look and mark them. You know, that was, that was the only way. So it's tough. But when you have that many boats looking, you create this this network this this mesh yeah that you can actually find the fish quicker and easier which is better for all of us sure you know and we're all honest with each other there's plenty of fish to go around yeah it's just like you said you're all in the same game <laughs> right you're getting your clients on fish you know what i mean right yeah it's, it's not i'm better you're better you you are what you are as a charter captain sure right if other captains help you you know you use the tools you have once you know you find the fish um are there better charter captains than others of course sure um and that's just i truly believe that there's certain people that are meant to be fishermen and certain people that with no insult here that as much as they try they're never really going to be good fishermen just like I, the example i use all the time is i could golf for the rest of my life i'm never going to be tiger woods right that's not insulting to me it's just what people are meant to do you know i truly believe so some charter captains are really, really good. Some some are, you know, okay. You know, they get the job done. Yep. But we try to help them as much as sure. possible for everybody to get the job done. Someone helped you at one point, I assume? Not really. Not really? No. And you're trying to change that because no because one really helped that. you. Yeah. That's nice. I think that's... Nobody think that's nobody helped me nice. in the beginning. That's why I went a year and a half without catching fish. I bought all the wrong stuff. I did everything wrong. 
Sometimes that's what it takes, though. And I mean, honestly, you're probably that much better of a captain now because you taught yourself and you had to go through everything that was wrong. And I taught taught myself in a different way than most people were used to doing it because I had to learn it on my own. You didn't get spoon fed. Right. Yeah. You know, so. so. Killer. Right. It's killer. Um, I want to get to more about the fish and the size of fish. Mm -hmm. What. I found interesting over the years and talking to you and other guides is like growing up watching that wicked tuna show, those guys are commercial fishing. Mm -hmm. And once I understood more about how many you can catch, how big it is, I'm like, wow, there's a lot to this that I just don't understand. In general, explain the difference to our listeners between a rec size fish mm-hmm. and a commercial size fish rec size meaning recreational Correct. and a commercial just, explain to our listeners like what what's the difference just size it's just size just size what are like what is the size limitations for both so from a so uh we'll start with recreational yep so a recreational fishermen have a little bit different of a, a limit per day than charter captains okay so we have what's called over and unders i've heard people say that right an over so let's start on the small end 27 to 47 inches is what we consider our unders okay 47 to 70 47 is shy of 73 yep so 72.9 whatever it is that's considered our overs as charter captains we're allowed three unders and one over Regardless of how many people you have on the boat. Correct. It's it's a boat. So the license is, yes, my name is on the license, but the boat is licensed. Gotcha. Because you don't catch tuna from shore. Gotcha. So they license the boat. So it's a boat creel limit. Gotcha. Um, recreational guys are allowed the same except one less under. They're allowed two unders and one over. Okay. Um, in general, I think that's way too much fish for any for yeah. any group of people to go. Yeah. Um, I usually talk people talk to people about it on the trip, and I don't I don't normally keep our limit. I knew that getting into going with you because I've gone and caught tuna before with my buddies in New Jersey, and they're like, "Hey, we're going to Cape Cod tomorrow. You got to take all these fish home." And I caught you know, like a thirty pounder and a fifty pounder, and I was like, "Awesome!" Well, when I started cutting this up, I'm like, "It's more what the hell am I gonna?" And and you right. said that you're like. We're cutting the fish up that we brought back, and you go, you got people to give this to, right? And I already knew. That's just one fish. I I know. That's just one fish, and it was 54 inches. Right. And I go, I know what you're saying. Yes, I got you. I wouldn't take the fish if I didn't have a million people to give it to. No, but that's not the average person. So the average person that comes on my boat, I see a lot, is they want to kill everything. Yep. Everything. How how many striped bass do you guys want to keep today? As many as we can. How many tuna do you guys want to keep? As many as we can. They want to kill everything. Yep. They feel like um, they want to get their money's worth. Sure. For what they pay. Uh, that's not really how I built my business. Um, so I'm strictly catch and release for striped bass now. Um, tuna, I limit what people can keep. And that's not because um, I want to protect the species just a little bit. I try to sell my charters as an experience. You told me that before. Yeah. I, I want to go out and have a great time, and you guys experience some fishing like we've never experienced before. Sure, you know, a light, like a lot of the other things, the experience in life, you pay for the experience. If you went skydiving, you wouldn't want to take the airplane home when you're done. You know what I mean? You're paying for the <laughs> yeah, experience, or the parachute, or the parachute. Yeah, yeah. You're just paying for just That's like a, ro- just like be, a roller man, coaster. You're going to leave it when you're done. Yeah, yeah. People don't understand that though. Right. But it, I think it's easy to like once you do have a banner day with them, it's easy to sway them into like. Well, tuna, thinking about it differently. I, I, now, you know, don't get me wrong. I don't want it to come across as as a, an insane conservationist. No, I have no, no. I have no issues important. with people it's taking tuna sure. home with them. Yeah. But when people tell me, you know, I have the friends and the family thing, and I'm like, you guys are going to have 300 pounds of meat. Yeah. So you could give six pounds to 50 people. That's that's that's. When have you ever gone to the grocery <laughs> store and bought yeah. six pounds of meat? Yeah. I mean, ever? Right. It's it's. it's Bluefin does not freeze well. It's very fatty. It doesn't freeze like yellowfin. Correct. Yellowfin is much more prone. Leaner. Yes. It's 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 lean. You know, so it freezes better. Um, and the people that said, "Oh, we want more blue," I said, "Listen, anytime you want bluefin for the rest of the year, you call me. Come over, and I'll give you as much fresh bluefin as you want. Right. Caught the day before. Looks like I'm coming over to get some bluefin. It's a long trip. 
I, was, ha- I have some. I told you. And I made, here, and he here said, we are. I made okay. so so right. I made so the tuna. This guy I made the tuna out, meatballs for these out. guys. And how good was it? I, I didn't have them yet. They they, them. they live five minutes away. They won't come over to my goddamn get, house I'm and pick them up. Right. So get them today. so for example, it's one fifty four inch fish, right? That's probably got to weigh. Did you give away any meat yet? I spent the entire first day driving around, dropping it off my neighborhood. Right. Right. Sixty pound fish. He's got forty pounds of meat off that fish. And three weeks later, he still got it. <laughs> and these people want to keep two more of that size yeah. and a bigger one. Did you freeze some? Yeah. yeah. You have the to. steaks. Yeah. yeah, I have a vacuum sure. sealer at for home. Sure. I mean, yeah. I deer hunt, so I, I, I keep meat like right. for a while. Even the vacuum sealer, what will happen with bluefin is they'll start to brown out a little bit. Yep, totally. And it doesn't it doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. It changes Just, color it significantly. Changes color. And I, know, I took some out the other day. I had a steak that when you seal it up, it's like... Nice light colored pinkish yeah, yeah, red. Yeah. You take it back out after a couple of weeks. It's, it's like maroon, darker. a little yeah, darker. Yeah. Makes but sense. But you though. eat it, tastes almost the, sure. almost the same. Okay, sure. right. but you look at it. But it's also it, in your head. Too. Yes, it's in your head because I knew what that fish looked like when we opened it up, when I vacuum sealed yeah. it, and now I'm looking at it. I go, is this fucking thing? Bad? I almost <laughs> right. sent you a no, picture. I'm like, no, is this bad? It's not bad because think about. 90% of the bluefin that are eaten in this country were caught here, sold to Japan. For sure. We buy from Japan and bring them back here. Yeah, why? Yeah, that's, that's crazy. A, that's a two that's, or three week period. I know, right that's there, crazy to me. In too. between the time that that fish was swimming. That's a that's another two hour podcast of the shit show of how bluefin tuna are sold yeah, that we're no, not going to get into. Why is that, that the be, route though? Like why to Japan and then we're going to buy it everybody back wants to make money. I guess, yeah. Well, All right, I, so... I mean, yeah. Let's let's well, anyways, let's I'm keep going. Okay. No, let's it's come yeah. get the damn meatballs because I, I got no. So what's good with the I'm killing meatballs. deer now. You what? What's good with the tuna meatballs? Like, how do you eat them? He said just like pan sear them and then they're well, already I, cooked. I, I, would, I bet they're vacuum sealed. They're already cooked. Right. I was thinking of different ways. So the tail cuts on a tuna are very there's tendons in them. Okay. Right. Yeah. And it's hard to separate the meat. Sure. So I just Grind took all up. the tail cuts rather than throwing them out or, or you know scraping them. Scraping and, yeah. them. I figured just put them in a meat grinder, and the meat grinder separates the meat from the tendon sure. within seconds, and you just pull the tendon out like a rubber band. Yeah. And then I was taking all the meat, and I was putting a little bit of breadcrumb, egg, garlic, and meatball, right? Yeah. In the oven, and then right when I took it out of the oven, I'd bring it out, I'd put a little teeny splash of soy sauce on it, back in the oven on broil, and crisp the just the top of it, but the center of it was still raw. Sounds delicious. Yeah. For good. those of you listening, it's <laughs> noon awesome. and my mouth is watering it's right yeah, now. It's, it's pretty <laughs> good. Go get some burgers, I'm, Scotty. Dude, I'm, I'm right? making some of those today. No, it is, it is pretty cool. And I did that. And did it you worked. cook them in the oven? And, yes. Okay. And it was awesome. Yeah. I didn't do the whole like Chef Matt over here so, bullshit, but it, it, it worked no, out I mean, pretty well. We have well. enough of it. So when We I, have enough of it yeah. throughout the year, so I try to find different ways. Have to. Because you can't keep eating It's the same thing I do with deer. You shoot two, three deer. you got to find different ways. Different ways to make it. So when I take them out of the vac seal, should I put them back in the oven to warm them up? They will be frozen. Them. You just need to find a way to reheat them without overcooking them. So put them on like 175. Yeah. Okay. In the oven. Well, I'm not going to. That's I, not going to cook. I, I should probably wait for them to thaw all the way out. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. yeah. <laughs> but then put them on 175. Jesus, because Because your, no. your, 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 your <laughs> no, meat, meat is typically done at 160. You know? Yeah, yeah. And all bluefin that you've eaten in this country for sushi has always been, been frozen. So people are like, oh, I don't, I don't want bluefin if it's been frozen. If you've ever eaten sushi in this country in a restaurant, it's been frozen. Yeah. Legally, it has to be frozen. Yeah. Flash frozen. Flash frozen. I did so let's, have some fresh so let's, in last year. I, I like the commercial, the whole aspect of like when it's open, the tonnage and all, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. I just, I'm a nerd when it comes to that. I think it's super interesting. So like for people that like don't understand it, and they wouldn't, you watch a little bit on Wicked Tuna, you gain a little bit of knowledge of like open days, closed days, like how what generally like how does that all work like that started that during covid okay so what happened is well they all the rfds they're called recreational fishing or rec, restricted fishing days excuse yeah, me okay so they they've always had them but they've never really implemented them so during covid when uh, you know a lot of the world's restaurants were shut down the fishermen were still fishing right where are flooding fish, the market yes where are these fish going so the buyers needed time to find places to sell them to get rid of them. Right. So that's where they put the restricted fishing days. Okay. Space out. And it used to not be like that. No. Like in no. that show, I remember watching. They used to keep four a day. 
<clears throat> well, that's so what they do is they they op- change it to one now. They op- no, they change that's seasonally. That's seasonally throughout the season. Okay, so they usually open it with three, which is it used to be the opposite. So they used to open it with one, and as the season progressed, they would look at the amount of fish coming in for the amount of quota that they had. Okay, and if the season if the quota wasn't being filled at the rate that they thought it would be being filled at, they would raise the daily limit. Gotcha. So they got there. Now they're opening it at three for the past couple. Excuse me, the past couple of years, and then they're decreasing it as the that. season goes on. Yeah, which there's nobody really understands that because the, when the fish show up in June, they're um, some of the worst quality red meat fish, meat. right? Yes. That's what they say. There's no, fat. not a lot of fat on they them. They just got here, but the quotas at opening at three, so you're right. putting you're flooding, flooding the market, market with, with red garbage, meat fish, garbage fish. Why you is know? why are they so much lower quality? Where there's no fat. fat, there's no fat. There's the, yeah, the, but why? the bait. The, uh, like what's their, what they're well they, they probably they're made no, they just, 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 they, just like if you drove somewhere nine hours yeah. you're probably going to be hungry when you get there sure you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. they burned it up on the spawn they, they burned traveled it up on the spawn they burned it up on the travel okay um and they're not eating on the run yeah you know they are eating on the run because pelagic fish never stop but yeah. um they get to the cape as this is their buffet okay yeah you know yeah. um so you don't want them pre-buffet and it's the warmer water too so fish don't really build fat in warmer water they don't need to yeah, you know. So what do you do if you catch a a giant over seventy three inches? I didn't sell and one fish, and this it's year. closed. What I didn't do you, sell one fish this year. What do you do when it's closed? Uh, you swim them. Swim them. There's two things you can do with giant tuna. You can either, if you're gonna let them. Okay, you can go ahead. Sell them. Yep. Or let them go. It's the only thing to exude. with a giant. Yes. Over fish seventy three inches. It's all you can do with it. Got it. Because if if they had a loophole. There'd be guys driving around with 800 pound fish in the trunks of Honda Civics. Right. Not knowing what to do with this thing because they don't own a samurai sword to cut it up with when sure. they get home. So, and, and people would be doing it. Right. You know? How does, so let's say you did sell one. Okay. Did you sold one before? Right. You got your yeah, commercial yeah, yeah, yeah. license. Like, how does that happen? You go out, you're chartering, or you're with your buddies. It's an open day. Mm-hmm. You catch a giant, mm-hmm. the fish is in the boat. Which now it's like four hours later, you got to wheel the thing in the boat. Now what? How do you sell? How do you go from being 10 miles out in the ocean to that fish? Like, what's that process? You call your buyer, a buyer. A buyer. There's multiple buyers? Yes. Yeah, there's a bunch of them. Uh, even on the Cape? Yes. Okay. And and the problem is I'm all the way on the tip of the Cape. Yep. So I'm a nightmare. Yep. A lot of us out there are nightmares because the buyer has to drive all the way to the tip of the Cape. Yep. Grab one fish, turn around, and go all the way back. Gotcha. Um. They don't really want to do that. <laughs> they want to either wait a little bit, see if multiple people come in with fish. Yep. Multiple buyer in the wait. Um, if a guy's fighting a fish right now and you're at the dock, he's going to say, yeah, I'm going to wait. And I'm not going to take your fish until he comes in. Right. You know? Um, it's, so you, it's a pain. If you got a 600-pound fish uh-huh. in your 20-foot center console, like what? so the buyer comes, but like, what's he bring? Listen... So, so the people that are getting into this, do not get into this if you think you're going to make money. Right. Right? The only way, and this is one thing we always sit with, it, the only way you're going to become a millionaire tuna fishing is if you were a Started billionaire. Started a billionaire. I love yeah. that phrase. <laughs> right. Because it's so true. Well, what's happened is that show, Wicked Tuna, ru- which I love. Has ruined it. Has absolutely ruined the the thought of the general person thinking how much a bluefin is actually that show. Worse. That show is extremely scripted reality TV. Correct. Yeah. But the specifically what I'm getting at is the prices they at the prices. which they sell those tuna for. You can actually watch the buyers laughing a little bit when they tell them the price. It is nowhere near what, they them, what like you... Because what are telling them, like 14 a pound? Oh, 14, 17, right. 25. Oh, like, oh it's no, a diamond. No, 14 is a shit fish. Yes, on the yeah. show. Yeah, on yeah, the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. I, I can't tell you the last time I got 14 for a fish. Yeah. Our price is average, like three, four, five that's what, bucks. That's what I was yeah. telling him yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, you get a fish that's like eight nine that. bucks a pound. Like that's, that's a good fish. Yeah. Oh my god, that's a, that's a top great of the fish. class. Yeah, that's yeah. A great fish. Yeah. You know. So the it's why it, why why do they do that? I, I just, because they it's can. reality show. No, no, no. Oh, why does the show do it, or why do the buyers do it? Why did the show? Why does the show do? The show it? do it because they would say, why are these guys spending all this money and getting eight hundred dollars for a fish? Like, what's the what, what are you doing? You can go get a real job. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You know what like, I mean? is it it's one of the things he asked. Like, you well, wanted to, to know. encourage people to like go do it themselves. Wait, no, like, what, 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 how they do they benefit do? off that? They don't. But what? what no, what, that's no. why. That's why you could see a lot of Pen One Thirties and Pen Eighties and Shimano Tiago Eighties 
for sale for one season old. Yeah, yeah. Now, yeah. because people think it's going to be easy. <laughs> yeah. They think they're going to. And they're going to become a millionaire. Yeah, yeah, they're going to become a millionaire. A they, this guy got twenty five thousand for this. When that, yeah. if you see a big fish posted on Facebook, look at all the comments. Oh, that's a ten thousand dollar fish. That's a million dollar fish. Yeah. You know, and they'll they'll always refer to those those couple businessmen for those fish sold in Japan for like one point two million, one point four million. Those were very specific cases where a CEO or a CFO of a company wanted to make a name for himself. So he put a huge amount of money out, was in the paper for doing that, and then used that specific fish at a giant banquet where they'll fly in like glacier ice and they lay the fish out on glacier ice. Yeah. That's why. But on a on a on a on a typical auction block, these fish aren't selling for they're selling for substantially more than we get, but we have to pay out of our pocket comes the flight. Air freight, yep. The auction fees. So if the fish sells for twenty eight bucks a pound and we get six, yeah. Because the buyer is gonna take his, his cut. cut too. And then he's got to pay the guy who runs the truck to come and pick yeah, it up. Yeah, so another thing is you don't actually get paid on the spot from no. the buyer. You have no, to you have to trust thing. the buyer. Yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, a week yeah, or two yeah, late. Yeah, I asked my buddy this. He sells yeah. commercial fish well, in New Jersey. Thing they show, they, on the show. I go, like, exactly. I go, when, on the spot. when do you get paid? He goes, two weeks later. I go, you ever feel like you're getting effed on price? No, you he goes, might get, you every might get time. Your, you might get your price two weeks sure. later. And then your check will come a month later. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, oh, you're going to give me 80 cents a pound for the fish? And you're like, thank you. I want my I want my fish back. And they're like, oh, well, it's five hundred dollars to get your fish back. Jesus Christ. It's yeah, it's yeah. great. So okay. Or no, your it's... fish doesn't sell on the auction block and they send you a bill. Really? Well explained. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? They send you a bill for for the Because they the have auction. to keep it now or no, oh, they okay, give you your okay. fish back. Oh, okay. But, and, but you have to pay and, for and all and the transportation the, and, and whatnot. Well, that's, that's freaking that, hilarious, that's isn't very, it? That's crazy. Very, that's yeah. very rare. It's such bullshit. Yeah, they don't tell you any of this on Wikipedia. So so okay, my point was you're you're not going to a dock. You're taking your boat out. How do you get a 600-pound fish? Do they, br- do they bring the truck. a truck? So legally, a fish cannot leave the boat. Okay. So you can't take the fish out of the boat and put it in your pickup. It's got to go to go a somewhere. buyer's truck. Because the, the, the fish has to stay with the license. Gotcha. So most of the all the buyers have their box trucks, and they have a small winch, an, an arm winch yep. on, the back of the tr- on the back of the truck. It'll swing outwards. The cable come down. They'll lower it into the boat. Are they in your boat tying the tuna up, or are you doing I'll, that? For I'll, I'll be in the boat, and we just they put the trust wrap you, on the, yeah. right? And there'll be wrap on the. T- they don't care. It's my fish. Sure, you know. Uh, if I they drop the fish on his head, it's They're, I'm the one who loses. Yeah, not them. Um, and then they'll just wrap the fish up. They'll bring it up. They'll swing it out of the boat. They'll lower it back down to the ground, and then they'll put the scale on the winch, and then put the fish back on, winch it up. See how much the fish weighs. Yep. Drop it down. A fish typically loses about twenty percent of its body weight when you dress it. You know, no head, no tail. Yep. Um, and then um, and then um, they cut you your check for a million. Yeah, right there. You know, just <laughs> yeah. I, I, I hear no, it all the time. No, not even a check. Just I hear it all the time. They're like, yeah. they're like, are those guys waiting at the dock? I said, yeah, they're all waiting at the dock with just briefcases of hundreds, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. These guys you know? would be getting they, robbed left yeah, they and just, right. they just make it rain towards you. you so know? You, you don't really make a living as a commercial fisherman these no. days. People, no. like, they don't just do that. No, well, it's the people that are and the states chartering. Have, and the states have also done a really good job at hurting yeah. commercial fishermen. By regulation. Yeah, like yeah. the Cape. Like Keep the tip of the Cape fish. is... They're decimating the Dock commercial. space? You yeah. told me that in Pro- Provincetown? They're dec- trying to they're... move those guys out of there? But they're... do they have to to protect the species? Is that no, why? No, they have to because there's, it... not, there's more money something else. Yeah, yeah. Well, you it know? always goes back to one thing. And that's yeah. money. So. Absolutely. <laughs> the, the, the thing about overfishing a species is I do believe it's it happens. Yeah. But what happens is they overfish the species to the point where it can't recover quickly. So they switch to something else. And they start fishing for something else. In the meantime, that fishery is recovering. Like growing up in Long Island Sound, the fish has all the different names depending on who's listening and where they're listening. But Bunker, Pogies, sure. and Hayden, yeah, they used to be everywhere in the '80s, everywhere. And then the seine boats basically destroyed them in yep. the late '90s, early 2000s. Yep. And then they put limits on those. Plus, those boats really couldn't do it anymore because there was none left. And now they're coming back. Yep. Big time. 
So that's one of the other reasons is I've seen a I've seen a change in the tuna fishery over the past ten years, and um, I'm not I'm a slightly concerned at where it might be in another ten years because we have a lot of big fish. You're not seeing right that now. replenishing. I'm not seeing class. that earlier stock that we used to see. When you see a species that it, this is you know predominantly big big, that's bad. You know, because it's yeah. all adults. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're the kids. The issue with that species, and like striped bass, is they migrate. And every place has a different limit, regulations. When your fish... Or law. Period. Or law. Or, or right. no freaking laws. Right. Like, when your fish is going to the other side, you know, to the Mediterranean right. Sea... Yeah. We, we, we're great with the rules over here. Yeah. But when but these fish go leave, overseas, what are they fucking who knows? gone? Who knows? Dude. Well, it's like striped bass when they go down to Chesapeake Bay, too. Like... Sure. The regulations they come back, are different. Every than state, here, those fish migrate you know, through like so. eight different states. Every state is different. Yeah. Every limit is different. Every the, slot limit is different. The whole striped bass thing is I have I have huge opinions on that because I've been so involved with striped bass my entire life, and I've seen it go from the late '80s to none of them. Sure, yeah, none yeah, yeah. to more than I've ever seen in my life in the '90s, and then 2001 was the last 50 I caught. And these aren't Block Island 50s. Yeah, I got fishing you. in an aquarium. Yeah. Um, these are real 50s. <laughs> yeah. Um, and there's there's none of them anymore. You know? I mean, they're, they're here and there. I know. But, I know but what you're in saying. But in general, you know, the sensational 70s of what the back beaches of the Cape were are gone. I don't think it really has anything to do with anything but the amount of fishermen. The amount of fishermen has got to be recreational, yes. not commercial. Not commercial. Yeah. For, oh, for sure. Even right. I mean, catch and release. Right. Oh, it's got to be it's, twenty. It's got to be twenty times what volume. it was ten years ago. Ten years, fifty, twenty years ago. It, you know, people look down on fishermen. They're like, you, you can't afford food. Like yeah. you fish, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's cool. And now you can walk through the grocery store and you could tap any guy on the shoulder and he's like, "I'm a fisherman." Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And. The amount of just just with the, the the number of recreational licenses that Massachusetts gives away every year and sells every year, if each one of those people kept one striper, just one, you know, it's it's hundreds of thousands of stripers. Even if they didn't keep it, but just improperly handled it, which happens a lot. Oh yeah, it happens all know? the time. Which they've made circle hook regulations still, you know. for live bait fishing. Listen, sure. I don't want to bring this podcast down and get depressed on straight no, bass. Right, we right, can right, get right, depressed right, on right, something else. Right. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Right. No, you, no, you are correct. And the I, circle hook thing is a whole different, different thing. What uh, we're talking about is just like the fluctuation of this this bluefin fishery and it's them just, leaving here and just there's no laws other places. Right. The regulations are like we are held to a there's standard so much, here. There's so much black market with. It's hard to regulate, put a worldwide regulation on. What I consider, and the world considers, to be probably the most valuable fish in the ocean. Sure, you know, for sure. And um, if it's if people are willing to pay it, they're going to get it. And what Wicked Tuna did, I, the, the huge disservice to the to the fishery. Did you see an uptick of the amount of boats trying to target tuna after that show yeah. aired for like a few years? Yeah. Yeah. Like it took a few years for people. Hey, the show, the show, watch it. And then after like four or five years, five six years ago, if I was going out in my boat tomorrow, the ramp would be empty. Right. Now there's twenty five thirty boats out there. It's all the beginning of November. It's all business. No, not yours. Oh no, not mine. <laughs> Ours. No, no, it has helped mine because everybody wants to go out and catch, sure. catch wicked sure. tuna. Wicked, you know. Wicked. Um. So, but but what 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 that did, what that show did, is it 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 doesn't properly um educate people on what these people are really doing right oh which is awful out there yeah they need to so so the buyers started giving really the price dropped dramatically about six seven years ago when everybody started doing this and the buyers are, are and if i was a buyer i'd probably do the same thing i'm like okay we're paying a really really bad money but we still have people lined up around the block to give us fish. So why would we ever start paying them more? Yeah, for sure. And like you said, there's cases where they'll only buy from certain people because the way you take care of the fish. Or it's just favoritism. Favoritism, but like people, <laughs> yeah. like if you call and you're like, I got a fish, I'm at this dock, mm -hmm. I'll be there, whatever. The guy's like, 
okay, I know Matt ices his fish down, guts it, and keeps it, mm -hmm. versus some Joe Schmo out there that doesn't put any ice on it and gets yeah. back and the thing's yeah, freaking yeah, yeah, 75 yeah, yeah. Like, degrees in a boat. It does something Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. doesn't bleed it. Whatever. The fish is burnt. The skin's crispy. How is that not fraud? Like, like Dude, reality Again, TV. that's its own podcast. <laughs> I just, oh, it, oh, it is. Yeah, it's, but like, how can they... There's, I, it's there's just like, such, how can they not be responsible? There's for, like, politics involved in that situation that is Literally fraud. Insane. I, I, I've seen it. It's literally fraud. In every aspect of commercial, from what I've dealt with with commercial fishing my entire life. Not just bluefin either. Not just it's fuck, it's stripe, everything. Stripe, I know. Stripe, 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 you're not going to solve it, bro. No, I know. Let it go. Stripe, it's just like, stripe, stripe I can't passes. believe they're allowed to do it. That's what I'm getting at. It's, it's well, crazy. They're, well, they're their own business. They can do whatever they want. You don't have to sell them. Yeah. It's just like a casino. Oh, you're winning a lot? You can go now. What do you mean I can go now? We, you can leave. Yeah. Because a casino has the right to kick you out if you're winning. You know, you can't say no. You have to keep giving me money. It's just like if you don't like the price I'm giving you, go somewhere else to a different buyer. Well, I'm buyer. talking more about like how can reality TV? No, like I know what that, you're. Yeah, I know what you're like, saying. It's, oh, like I, told, I totally know what you're fraud. saying. Yeah. It's a shit show, yeah, for lack like, of a better term. It is. Um, I can't believe they're, they're legal, legally allowed to do that. I mean, just watch. Just watch the editing behind the show. Yeah. I mean, they fight one fish with three different color lines. <laughs> yeah. Unreal. It's and cloudy. Two different shirts. It's, yeah. yeah, they hook yeah. it when it's slicked out. Now it's <laughs> blowing four or five footers. <laughs> right. Two different colors. Like, come on. And people don't know. I mean, anyways, I, I still like the show because I, I, I need to watch something tuna related during the off season. So I'm going to continue to watch well, it. What we'll do is over the next couple of years, we'll make hours and hours of videos on our own. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we can watch that over the winter. All right. I'm into that. I'll come film you guys. Yeah. There's, okay. there's hours Catch and hours tuna. of podcasts <laughs> that can go into different subjects. Just the, the t last 10 that we've touched on. Well, that's what I said us. when this show started. You're like, bro, just jigging will take two hours. I'm like, we're going to hit on everything. Oh so we're going to move this along. Yeah. Um, we'll have to have a part. I want to talk about the gear, specifically the hollow core, really why I wanted to bring you in. I want mm -hmm. the listeners that might be thinking about getting a different brand of hollow core on their reels. Hey, I've heard of C16. I've heard how great it is. But I only hear it from the guys at Cortland and tidbits from people around in the industry. But like, since I've known you, which is like a couple years now, um, since I became a sales rep at New England, I, I started scrolling through Instagram. I'm like, who's this Titan Up Charters keeps tagging us? Like this, this content's epic. So I reached out. I'm like, hey, looks like you tagged us. You you said you use C16. Like, you mind if I use that photo? Absolutely, go ahead. And then we started talking, and you're like, dude, I love C16, and you've always told me that. But why? Why, as a listener to the show, do you personally, you do this day in and day out, why do you love the Cortland C16 Spliceable Hollow Core? Give me, like, generally, you know, a, a few different... Reliable. 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 I, I, it's very easy to work with. Um, it's very smooth. It will not break down. It will not dissolve. It will not fall apart like your older Dacrons used to. Um, it can last a long time. How long you said that last I've year? Ne I've never, I've never had to change it out for any reason, other than um, um, capacity break. Yeah, something funky something broke had, yeah, or something. And you need more line capacity. And you need more on. line. Um, and that's the great thing with the C16 is you can, you can back splice it, and you don't need to redo your entire spool. You can splice do, line to line. Yeah, line to line with the helicore. You can do a loop to loop connection for yourself, and um, very similar to my spinning reels that I use it on, where. I don't empty the entire spinning reel now. I go about two thirds down and I'll do a loop to loop connection with the C16 with a simple cat's paw and fill up the spool again. Right. You're going down into the spool where like, you're probably not gonna see that, but if you did, it's fine anyways. It's, it's fine anyway. It's not gonna get daily use. Though. No, it's not gonna get daily use. And even if it did, it wouldn't matter. Right. Because on my on my big reels, my bent butts, um, daily use on that thing. Sure. In and out, in and out, in and out all the time. The C16 is what's used on all of my wind down leaders, which is a splice, back splice, sure. into a finger splice, into a cat's paw. And on daily use, that's casted through the guides hundreds of times Correct. every day. So daily use is no issue. I have found that the C16 is much quicker for me to splice with. It opens, that's one of the things I've heard people, it opens up, it's like a, for those of you that don't know about splicing and hollow core, it's basically like a finger trap puzzle, right? But the right. way the hollow core are specifically, the way it opens up, that you can serve a needle inside it to it splice in mono or floral. It doesn't bind. Right. 
to the needle or to the mono right. during the splice process is as much as other hollow cores. Okay, but have. at the same time, when you pull the needle out and your that's, splice that's, is in there, that's different. Now it's holding. That's different. So, yes. like, you can have a braid that opens way up, but is it going to hold what you're putting inside it? So, it's kind of the best of both worlds, is what you're saying in terms of spliceability, but also yes. the hold of the splice, right? Right. And I've and I've done this and I've proved this time and time again. Where, um, so, uh, fishermen tend to be creatures of habit, and they do things one way, and they do it constantly this way because they know it works. Fishermen should always be improving. They should be looking to get better. They should be looking to make their job easier. They should be looking to make catching fish easier and try to do it with less expense also. So I splice very short. And last year I was actually on the phone with you, Brooks, and we, I ran into an issue with after how many fish had to be on that one rod. It had to be 150, 200 fish on that one rod. It smashed the, the C16 down so tightly, I couldn't get a needle up it as far as I needed to go. I thought. Mentally comfortably, yeah, Mentally from comfortable. what you're used to doing. And I had asked you, and I know exactly what you're talking about, and I'll right. let you finish. I go, Matt, how, you know, you're like, I think it might be salt packed. It's really tight. I go, well, how old's a braid? He goes, I don't know, it's probably five years old. I go, that's a long time. And you go, well, let me try this and keep going. And I, and I went up. Um, not because I thought it was good enough, but I said, I'm going to try this and I'm going to see if it's good enough because there's only one way to tell. And I use very short top shots on my reel. I use about a hundred yard top shot of mono on my reel. I went up the C16 and if anybody, um, would like to see the short video of this, I have about a 30 second video of me reeling this fish in. We caught nine giants that day. These weren't giant giants. These were in the four or 500 pound range. Um, and every single one of them was on that same rod with a 12, 13 inch splice. What's traditionally how long do you splice? It's ridiculous. Three feet. Three feet. But but um, the old school tuna fishermen, the old, you know, um, the old salt guys were always goes 12 feet. Right. And they would come in and then they'd go back out. Correct. They'd come in and go back out, which I think adds a complete disservice to the physics behind a finger splice. Okay. Because you're, you're taking away the ability for the line ahead of the in and out behind it to finger splice. Right. To bite to under bite. tension. When you come in, when you come out of a line and then go back in to continue splicing, that's your serve right there. That's your serve. So you can't get a full, um, you can't get a full finger trap on the first set of spliced line. Because once the mono comes out of it, that end of the braid is not going to be able to bite right there. So I just go in once. Even on the spinning reels, on the spinning reels, you can go in six inches. I fully believe you can go in six inches. Because you go in six inches, or if you go in 10 feet, a finger splice is made to lock up no matter how far you go in. Right. If the braid has enough surface area to bite on the mono, yep. you're going to hold. Look at an FG knot, right? Yeah. An FG knot is an inch and a <clears> half <throat> to an inch of just the braid cross-haired around the mono, and that holds. And Makes it, sense. And people think that you have to go up very, very far. Look at the wind knots I use. I mean, what is that, eight inches? Right. You and know? how do you finish that? The, what do you mean? Like once you, you whip finish yeah, it. once how do you, do you so you serve up the mono oh, or the floor so, or whatever. So it's super easy. People, um, people tend to. Um, yeah. I did it too. I'm guilty of that. When I first started splicing, I thought there was this big complicated thing. And like here's an example. I don't know if people can see that on the screen, but I think we did that here. So if you which got, camera maybe, are we looking at here? Uh, you can look it right, right in the okay. middle one. So here's a perfect example. Your mono, and here's your serve, and this would be your hollow car. So your rod would be over here. And your braid would be here, your mono, your top gonna, shot. Yep, your top shot, correct, um, or your leader. Yep, a lot of if the time, you're spin fishing. Yep, no, or even your braid. Okay, right? so you can take your needle, you put your needle. The needle has a cup on the end of it. You're gonna push the mono into the needle, and it's gonna kind of bite. And then the needle's probably about ten inches long, and you're gonna run the needle up the braid. And then once you get up so high, you'll pull the braid down on top of the needle, on top of the mono, and then you're going to dump 
Come out with the needle. Come out with the needle, and you'll see your mono exposed. You could pull the braid down a little bit, clip the mono, and then push the braid back up over the top of the mono to make it disappear. You're going to hold this, for example, like this, and you're going to get yourself a bobbin. A bobbin, um, everybody probably knows what a bobbin is, but... Um, I, I filmed my buddy doing a splice that has a bobbin. I'll splice that in here. Right. So, that, so, the, so for those of you watching, you'll, you'll be able to right, see that Right, that would be here. great. And a bobbin is, is, you'll take the little spool of thread out of the bobbin. You'll push the two arms a little closer so that they're tight. Push the spool back in. And then I tie one overhand knot right here with the thread. And then bobbin up to here so it's tight. And then I'll start doing this faster like this. And all the way down here. How far onto the mono? Not far at all. That like does, that, like a quarter inch. Yeah, and that's and that's that's about as far as you want to go onto the mono. Going onto the mono is going to do nothing. It serves no purpose, no mechanical purpose, to helping the splice. Right. You just happen. need to go over where the braid ends. You go over where the braid ends, and because what you want to do is you want to push <laughs> down here, and at the end, when you get to the end of the braid, you're going to see the braid start to mushroom out. That's how you know you're doing a good job because the braid is now tight. Got it. And you want to create an even transition from braid to the mono. That's why you go over. Makes sense. But people who go down this far, there's no point in that because this is slipping on here. So is this a good splice? This is a great splice. Thank you. I'm so just, is, I'm just is kidding. Point, I didn't do that. Is the point of uh, whip finishing it or wrapping the thread? It's to create. Is it's it? a stop bag Okay. from yeah. happening. So it anchors it, basically. It anchors it because yeah. if you took, but say, you, say this was looser. If you took this braid and you just moved it down a quarter inch, an eighth yeah. of an inch onto the mono, you would be able to pull the mono right out of it. Yeah. Well, the, me and him were messing with it yesterday and like we were talking about anchor points and like, so do you, are you putting glue on top of the thread? You can. You finish it, but you it's can. not necessary. But it's not necessary. Just okay. like on an FG knot when you tie, you don't, you don't glue an FG knot. Could you use super glue you could use as any... an alternative to the thread instead and just no. anchor down that one point? No. No. Because how are you going to put it on? I now, I've done it. Yeah. I just wanted to prove to myself years ago that it would work. We we broke a fish off on the boat one day, and I took a needle, I ran the mono up a foot, and then I dropped super glue under the under the C sixteen, and I just started doing this real quickly yeah. with my finger, yeah. and I super glued two inches of the C sixteen to the mono. Yeah, took the slack out. Took the slack out. <clears throat> Plus, good. Cast it once. Seemed hooked up. If your splice doesn't pull initially, it's not going to. Yeah. A splice will not pull when there's pressure on a fish. Right. Because if it does, something was wrong. So to in begin the first with. three seconds of that fight. And no, you're no, on no, your, no, no, no. On the hook set. You're like, this is good. We're going to go. On the hook set. The minute you set the hook, boom, you come tight to the fish, rod folds it's over. It's stronger, it's, theoretically. Right. Yeah. Theory. Yeah. Right. So I, I just wanted to try it one day to see if it worked, and it did. And I was like, oh, my God. Now I'm never going to do it again. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but it, it worked. But it will work. And How long have you fished C16 for? Um, eight years. Because you've been fishing it before I knew you. Seven years? This is the this is the best part about why we work with certain people like look yourself. At what ha look at what happened. You 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 just messaged sure. me about one photo and here we are years but, later. But my point is as far as how Cortland works with certain people in certain fisheries with certain products. Mm -hmm. I love the fact that I'm able to work with someone that loved the product before we even knew each other, yeah. right? It's easy to get shit for free from a company and it be wasn't like, an, I love this stuff. It wasn't an influence. Correct. Sure. You know, relationship. You didn't know it, where it, the hell Cortland was. You right. drove by it every day going steal it right. fishing. It was, it was an organic relationship that built. For That's sure. my point. That's why I, I like, I mean, it just turns out you're a good guy. We like each other. It's but, a great I mean, friendship. You look, at, but, you, look at, you look at the Cortland symbol. The Cortland symbol is synonymous with quality. It always has been. It's always known to be. What we need to do is we need to have people understand why why the product stands out ahead of the other products of similar price. For sure. And what you're getting. For sure. You're getting an American-made product here. You know what I mean? You saw it. And you saw it. And I mean, who doesn't want to support our country? We all want to support our country. I fish the best product. I've had zero issues with it. If anybody has a problem with Cortland... Call me directly. I'll take your call. I love and it. I'll tell you what you're doing wrong. Yeah. Or what <laughs> happened or why it happened. Sure. Because 
the amount of times I put quote into the test and I've had any issues with it, if you have an issue, take it up with the company, take it up with me directly, or I'll take it up with the company. For sure. You know, but you won't have an issue. But that's my point. I just, I like working with guys that are into the brand before they even know anyone at the brand, right? That that just makes me want to work with people even 100%. more. 100%. Like my buddy Travis Manson, 100%. our boy Travis Manson, big smallmouth fisherman, like, he was fishing master. He didn't know anybody here. You know what I mean? And then yeah, eventually he reached out. Sure. Right. I reached out to you. Right. There's certain people I work with that are just like, I've been fishing this forever. Yeah. Our buddy Alberto, Alberto yeah. Nye, yeah. Nye, however you want to Alberto say it. Nye, he's yeah. going to come on our podcast pretty soon. Surfcasting legend. Surf, mm-hmm. OG surfcaster, right? Yeah. I remember one day we were looking through our Instagram and it was like the tagged photos. And I go, Ricky, click on that. He's like, who's this guy? I'm like, Alberto's an absolute gangster from back. I go, why is he tagging us? We reached out and he's like, I've been fishing your braid and your fly line. It's freaking shit's awesome. I'm like, (laughs) it just, it makes me, this, this industry is kind of funky in a sense, you know, like, Hey, this guy's legit. Let me hook him up with stuff. It's very unique. Right. Cause we're the only industry. I said it to Chris and I don't know why golf is always a thing, but if I'm really good at golfing and I'm posting pictures about golfing, Titleist isn't going to send me clubs. Right. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. they're going to be like, who yeah, are you? There's yeah. a million golfers <laughs> yeah. out there. Well, there's a million fishermen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's very unique in, in, in the way it works. It's because there's a lot of media that goes into sure. fishing. There's a lot of people with eyes on products and Agreed. what we're doing and recommend. Well, we live in a digital marketing world, yeah. right? And and like your Instagram is, as you saw for those of you watching and those of you that will look this up, um, your Instagram's fire. The digital marketing involved in that, I mean, it definitely helps move C16. Right. You know what I mean? When people are like, dude, this dude's oh, catching absolutely. giant fish. We need to post you know more I mean? of that on our account. We will. We need yeah, to but, it's, but it's also, it's, it's, it's knowing who you have that represents you correctly. Correct. So Onslow Bay, you know, they were they were talking to me about a boat and they, you know, um, they said, you know, whoever has boats in the area, we want to send them their way. Yep. So they can, you know, show them the boat. And I said, to her, I said, be careful on where you're sending them because you don't know what that guy's telling this person. Right. Know who you're sending them to. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because that person can make or break an entire deal for you. Sure. So know who is giving the correct information yep. about your line to the people. Sure. You know, and if they're not giving, you know, reach out to them and say, is there something that you guys don't know about the line or something I can help you with right. about the line? Yeah, let's get let's get back to line. What size C16 are you running on? What reels on your boat? Um, what I'm, size reels are you running? Your conventional, your 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 giant reels. What size reels are you running? What size okay, holocore so, are you running? So, How many yards of holocore are on those reels? So for the small, the smaller tuna reels, the trolling reels, stand up rods, I run eighty pound, and then um, I do it a little bit different than most guys do. I splice in about 40 yards of fluorocarbon at the top of my C16. The fluorocarbon acts as um, a leader slash top shot. Um, the reason I do that rather than having a top shot is because I want the capacity on those reels. Okay. So I, I fill the reels up almost to capacity with the C16 rather than using a top shot. Got it. Um, what you're saying is most guys will fill it up partway with the hollow court and then have a, they'll do, they'll a do 200 half and right. yard they'll, top they'll, shot or something they'll do like three, that. Three quarters spool probably. 200 feet, 200 yards. Two, 200 oh, yards. Okay. You know, Keep depend, going. Yeah, depend, yeah. Depending you. on um, the pound test you're yep. using. You know? So I do a little bit different. Now I don't have to figure out how long of a leader I want. Sure. Um, I, and it's, I just started doing that two years ago. It's worked. You're like trying new things, yeah. Like you said, right? The, and people are like, "Oh, that's pretty interesting that you tried something like that." And I said, "Yeah." What size are you running? On? You, you, Eighty wides, right? Are your giants? My giant rails are eighties. Yeah. And what size hollow? Twelve hundred. What size hollow are you running 200. on that? Two hundred pounds. Two hundred. How many yards at that? Twelve hundred. Twelve hundred. Yeah. Well, the first. Well, what was happening is I had the original with a smaller top shot, correct? Yes. Like you were saying. Yes, that was makes the, sense. That was my issue. Yep. So I was running. Um, 600 yards of 200. And then I was putting 200 pound top shot on top of that. Yep. I switched to a 130 top shot that has the breaking strength of 220 mono. Okay. So 
The braking strength was higher, yes, but the diameter was still the same as regular 130. So I was almost fitting twice as much top shot on as I was prior to that. I didn't want to lose all the the C16 that I had on the reel. So that's where when I got a hold of you guys, I got more C16 and I used, like we were talking about, splicing, where I put the two spools directly together. Yep. And I filled up the reel with an additional 600 yards of 200, which left me room for about 100 yards of 130. It seems crazy when people are conceptually like thinking about this, like how much added braid you're getting onto that reel. But what they don't probably understand is the braid, because of its construction, will lay flat under tension versus the mono top shot that you have, which is solid. So you're actually gaining a ton more capacity, like that's, you're talking that's about. That's why it's a hard way to... So we, we've we tried to um, measure braid. Yep. Braid is extremely, especially holocore. Especially holocore. How, how, people talk about diameter. There's no way to tell. Well, that's one of the things that we talk about here. It's like, people are like, what's the diameter of your holocore? I'm like, how would you like me to mic it? Yeah. Because I can right. slam a snap mic down on and make it about as thin as a freaking sheet of paper. So what, what, or we could do it under tension. So or, what we do is, and Jason yep. from Siren. Shout out Jason. Shout out Jason Ward, Siren Lures. Jason's the one who did this. Um, he weighs it. Per inch, per foot. So, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. So you take a microgram scale and you put two feet of line on it. And then two feet of the one you're trying to compare with it. Yep. And you'll see which ones. Right? Yeah, it makes the most that's, sense. That's the way to weigh it. Yeah, yeah. It because he sense. goes, you can't tell the diameter of, of uh, Halicor. If you, you were to tell the diameter, I guess you would want it as flat as possible. It's probably how it's going to be stored way, on but, the reel. But which way are you measuring it? Wide? or? Well, it's just like. That's my point. Yeah, that's, no, I know. You know what I mean? So it's anyways, not, it's yeah. a little funky. We it, just try to, I, I get people both ways. I go, and, and this is what the. And you can't do it with. You know, measure it with the with the mono in it. Okay, did you put eighty in it? Right, for sure. No. One thirty. Right. Yeah. What did you put in it. So and the mono won't be in it through the whole way around the reel, right. anyways. Right. So it's pointless. So there's really no way to measure yeah. the diameter. Um, I've I haven't had any issues, and I've put some serious serious heat. So the video that we did with Johnny Johnny Brooks from Australia three years ago, me and him and Jason fought um, that fish that was just shy of nine hundred pounds, and the C sixteen. Got ripped out of the spool, I think eight times. He dumped the entire dumped the whole dumped thing. the entire top shot, and then well, well into the braid, and that's the exact same line I still have on the reels to this day. I just filled the reels now to capacity because what I do is I change my top shots out quite regularly, okay. and I didn't want to keep wasting three hundred yards of top shot. I just wanted to do a quick hundred yard top shot, you know. Um, and then it was just easier to do. Makes and, sense. And um, now I have more capacity also. Cool. You know? Well, um, I don't want to cut this short, man, because I could probably sit in here all day and talk to you about because, I, I, like I said, I'm obsessed. Uh, I know you got to get back to Connecticut. Um, we have to do this. We have to finish up at another time. got to do a party. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into something. We have, we have top water. We have rigging. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like, that's what I want to do. I just wanted to give people, like, there's people that, don't know Cortland even makes holocore. Still to this day, there's people that knew nothing about the, the bluefin tuna fishery other than wicked tuna that they right. wash on Sunday nights. Um, so I just wanted you know to hit what? on and, everything. And the funny thing is there's a lot of people that don't know Cortland makes holocore. I didn't know Cortland made solid braid. Sure. I only knew Cortland for holocore. Sure. Okay. Which so th this, you, That's this, what you use, so it yeah. makes sense. Right. You know, no, but on every other know. rod I use, yeah, you use I use solid, solid spectrum braid, yeah. You know, yeah. are you solid? Sure, yeah. and and we'll get there by working together. You know, this podcast, everything. Have you fish our master braid yet? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. he does. Okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah, I fish on all my straight bass rods. Awesome. And the straight bass rods, you go out with 15, 20 rods every day. Oh, for sure. Knuckleheads, you know? wind knots, wind knots. <laughs> I that's the thing is, I use heavier, much heavier braid for the straight bass what rods. What do you than I would normally 50, use 65? 50. Okay, yeah. Because if I was fishing on myself, for yeah, myself, yeah. I'd be using 30. Yeah, that's what I run you know, on. Or, even, or, or even lighter. Yeah. But it's hel it helps to get wind knots out Sure. You know, when the, with the thicker braid. We could talk that about that for two hours. So <laughs> anyways. There's too much to talk um, about, man. Dude, I appreciate you coming out today. Absolutely. Thank you for all your insight. Um, I could talk about this all day, like I said. Specifically this fishery, specifically this product. I'm glad you got to see the plant. Because now you at least know yeah. where we work all day. And yeah, how... that, that was that was incredible. I love I seeing that. It's pretty sweet. Um, we are lucky to work here, bro. It is pretty neat. 
there's a lot of other places that Absolutely. are sound cool and then you go there and it's not so cool but this is pretty cool place yeah. to work so um it's the best man. if you guys are interested in hollow core the ins and outs um splicing techniques more importantly um if you're on the fence about making the jump to Cortland c16 the benefits of why the Cortland C16 is better than some of these stuff out there. You can reach out to us, of course, at info at cortlandline.com. You can absolutely reach out to Matt. Um, Instagram's probably the easiest way yeah. on a DM. Um, if, if anybody's watching videos, how-to videos, and they're not sure about that video, and they, they don't know how it's going to work out sure. or how it's going to play out in their own scenario, just send me a message. Send me the link for the video. I'll cool. look it over and I'll see. Yeah. Because I'm going to tell you what I do doesn't work for everybody else because everybody's specific on their own, you know, the way they do things. But I'll tell you what works for me. And that's really all I can attest to. Works. But, you know, I'll help you guys in any way you need. Awesome. So, yeah, if you're interested in the brand, the Holocore, um, I mean, it's pretty much sold at almost every tackle shop as far as C16 up and down the East Coast. It's definitely blown up. Um, it's, it is, it is for sure. blowing up in a good way. Yes. Um, so reach out to your tackle shop if you're like, I'm sold. This is what I'm getting. Um, if you need a little bit more kind of pushing along as, as far as coming over the fence, reach out to Matt, um, like I said, on his Instagram. You guys have got to go on his Instagram and check it out at Tighten Up Charter CC. Like I said, you will waste an entire phone battery on videos. Just stare. It, the, the, the content is epic, dude. For sure. And it, if you're not into tuna fishing, I promise you that you will be into tuna fishing <laughs> after you watch this. And eventually, maybe you'll see Matt out on the water someday at Cape Cod. So, um, Matt Broby, thank you for coming in. Pleasure. Matt, as always. Always. Uh, maybe we'll come back up and go steelhead fishing next time you're up. Yeah. Um, for now, uh, we're going to go into the winter season. Maybe check Matt out at some seminars this winter. Tell me about this new, lastly, this new endeavor. You, you sent me a picture of something going on in your house that hopefully you can get done over the winter time that people will be able to watch and listen to you. What do you got going on, I'm going to do... I'll the, am I letting the cat out of the bag no, here? No, 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 no. I I mean, let's know. get it going, bro. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be, um, it's, it's be ever-evolving. Because what so I so is this. This right. studio is different than the first third third right. time we did but a show, I, and I don't know how it's going to go or or, or or what. But I want to start a platform where I help people, educate sure. people, and teach people, yep. and inform people on all the new stuff I'm doing, what's working, what's not working, the ups and downs of all the products. I can tell you how it's going to go. It's not going to suck. I know well, that. I, I, it's let's let's see. But I mean, if I have products like this. And all the products, Costa and stuff that support me. Shout out Joe Gugino. So shout out to Joe. It, it's going to go good. For sure. It's going to go great. You know, um, and I want people to learn. I want to help people. So you don't know how it's going to be on YouTube I, or Instagram, but, but what I'm going to, it's probably going to be somewhat of a small subscription based thing where we can do um, the pay to and how to videos cool. on a yearly. We're going to do huge giveaways. So we're going to do huge giveaways. But it's information, giveaways. it's techniques, it's splicing, it's, it's it gear. Yeah. It's so like own, if, your you're, if you're if you're just a, yeah. it's good. It, well, thing. it'll probably be, you know, smaller videos up on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you'll have like a Patreon kind of thing. Right. Nice. You know, that's and, awesome. And I want to see how it goes. Yeah. You know, yeah, for sure. And oh. I'm, I'm building the studio in my basement now. Nice. Um, I'm going to have all the product and gear down there. And we'll be able to do a lot of hands on stuff. We're going to do stuff next year. We're going to do stuff on the water. Awesome. Um, and we're going to teach people and show people. Yeah, you know, for someone what, that's getting into this, just to go. This out. would have helped me if I had a, if I had a platform yeah. like this from from a local guy who was willing. I could have saved ten times the amount of money I would have spent on his subscription. Right. Just by doing it for a year. Just by not buying a bunch of junk. Yeah. Right. That, that still hangs in my shed and hasn't been used <laughs> in ten years. I think it's awesome that you have that attitude though, because a lot of people that had to do it themselves would probably. Be like, well, I had to do it myself, so like, no, I'm no, gonna no, leave no. everyone else in the No, dog. but you're, you're right. Still, you're you know right. what I mean? Yeah. The fact that he's like, yes. I just want to help people. So no, they have to but go it's the same thing. Did. It's awesome. There, but but it's a good attitude. F fishermen are kind of dicks. You know, some, what I mean, they're, yeah. they're, to put it some lightly, have, some have egos right. for sure. Right, but but I look at it in the way of you know, typically when people grow up and they don't really have a good childhood, it's it's that much more. They have that much more of a drive or motivation to be a better parent themselves. You know what I mean? Because they yeah. didn't have You're 100% yeah. correct. You know, and that's what I want to do is I didn't get helped. And I think our fishery, it would be beneficial for everybody who just 
spent a little bit of time helping the guy coming up um, and just schooled him a little bit. Yeah. You know, just not ignore him on the radio, yeah. not ignore his phone calls. <laughs> yeah. Or just blatantly, like it's happened, just blatantly lie to me. Yeah. You know? At the oh, end of the day, if awesome. you're able to do that, it's less dickheads you got to deal with out there on the water next But the good thing was, every, I found out... works who, better together. Yeah. At the I end found out who all those people were. Yeah. Right? Early on. I know who they all are. And it saved me the hassle of trying to be their friend later on in life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I got that out of the way. Right well, there. I'm looking forward to that, dude. I think it's going to be great. Yeah, that's I think that you're going to do a good job at it. So no, I can't wait for Cortland to be a part of it. Yeah, we absolutely good. will be. So just keep uh, keep an eye out on Matt's Instagram because when he's going to drop that, you're definitely going to post it it'll, on there yeah, to let it, people yeah, know. It'll, it'll go and live. like you said, it's evolving and everything. Right. So. Yeah, maybe check out Matt. A couple seminars in the Northeast uh, this winter. Uh, the Risa show. Mm -hmm. uh, we may be there. We may not. But I know you will be there. Um, we'll be promoting them either way. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, like I said, reach out to Matt on Instagram anytime you got questions on holocore or tuna fishing. Splicing. But, um, splicing. It is. Um, that's it for today's show, folks. Thank you for listening. Shoot us an email, info at courtlandline.com if you have any questions. Or give us a call. Um, we got a killer guest coming on next time. I'm going to keep that under wraps until we uh, actually have him on. I think we'll probably do another show here in a couple weeks. So, uh, Matt, again, thank you, sir, for coming in. That was awesome. Matt Broby, thank you for always being here and being a rock star customer service inside sales rep and all the hats that you wear on a daily basis. Uh, this is Cortland Hook, the podcast, everyone. Thanks for listening. Have a great day. Take it easy, guys.